council members and especially you guys that uh, have volunteered to be on the board to uh, partake in this uh, very important activity. Um, also, Ron, thanks for everything you've done. And so it's uh, an honor having you and I've sworn you in as the chair and, and now Todd. So we're gonna socially distance and all just for, uh, it's a little bit better to hear and all that, but we'll stay, stay apart right now without a mask. So. Todd, if you would uh, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear and affirm that I will faithfully perform the duties of the comprehensive plan, the duties of the comprehensive plan. Ad advisory committee member, advisory committee member of, the city, of the city and that I will support and defend the charter and that I will support thereof as well as the Constitution and the laws of the state of Georgia as well as the and of the United States of America. And of the States. Congratulations, Air. <laughs> and again, a sincere thank you to everybody in this room and it's, uh, it's great things that uh, you guys are doing for our community. Okay, with that, I think um, are we at six o'clock. So I would like to um, call the public meeting of the Milton Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee for January 28th, 2021 to order. I have first asked everyone to stand and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Public for which it stands. Well, welcome back. Welcome to 2021. We have a pretty full house here and I imagine we'll have a fairly strong attendance online as well. And I'll speak to, to that. Um, this is the meeting of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee or we'll refer to it tonight as CPAC. As you heard and saw, I'm, I'm Todd Chernick, the chair of this committee now. Um, I also am the chair of the Board of Zoning Appeals for those of you um, who weren't aware of that. This committee is a 16 member committee appointed for the purpose of creating and maintaining the city's comprehensive plan and to hold public hearings. Um, the committee has two ex officio officers and they are council member Laura Bentley and council member Paul Moore. I'd like to um, call roll and uh, when I call your name, if you could please announce your presence by stating present. Ron Gilbert, Zach Middlebrooks, Kurt Nolte, Zach is online. Kurt, did I hear a present? Uh, let's try to use our microphones as best as possible. So we, we do have people um, online. Fred Edwards, Marty Locke. Here. Jan Jacobus. Present. Sumit Shaw. Present. Laura Wysong. Martin Littleton. Heather Sparks. Brian Maloney. Present. Colt Whithall. Larry Johnston, Present. Johnstone, sorry. Present. Mark Arrington. Here. George Eunice. Present. Paul Moore. Present. Laura Bentley. She's on her way. And Laura Wysong is here for the record as well. Fantastic. Um, do we have the meeting agenda? Oh, actually, before we do that. So um, I've recently been appointed by city council as the chair and as part of the uh, um, structure for this committee going forward, we are to um, appoint 
a vice chair to serve in my absence to run meetings such as this. Um, at this time, I would open the floor for a nomination and a second for a vice chair. Do we have a second? Um, is there any discussion? Are there any other nominations? All right. Um, for uh, we'll just do a typical committee. Um, all those in favor say aye. Opposed say nay. So all those in favor of Sumit Shaw being uh, the vice chair for the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. By my ears, that's a unanimous consent for uh, Vice Chair with Samit Shah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, that's two for two, because I understand last night you were appointed chair of the Planning Commission. Yeah, yes, that's right. All right, well, that <laughs> says that uh, you must be doing something right. <laughs> Let's hope so. Public service announcement I was discussing with the mayor is if you volunteer at the city of Milton, um, you can be assured to be busy, and if you do, um, if you do engage, you also may find yourself rapidly promoted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, congratulations, Sumit. Thank you. I welcome the opportunity to work closely with you. Uh, Sumit and I served on the board of zoning years ago together as well. Um, in terms of the agenda, do we have tonight's agenda to display? So I'd like to um, make a motion to adopt uh, tonight's meeting agenda as published. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, we may choose to work through our five minute break. We'll see how time's going at that point. Um, all those in favor of approving tonight's agenda as published say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. That's been adopted. Um, in terms of public comment this evening, um, I would like to acquaint you with some of the rules and procedures. We have folks here physically in chambers, um, and there are folks also joining online, whether that be via Zoom, uh, Facebook Live, or telephone. And um, we would welcome opportunity, this as an opportunity for you to speak. There'll be two public comment sessions, as you saw from the agenda. The first is, um, we'll be coming here just momentarily. The second public comment period will be uh, prior to our, the meat of our discussions and prior to us adjourning our meeting. Uh, each person wishing to speak here in person should fill out a, a yellow public comment card and leave that with a member of staff. Um, we'll call your name as well as those um, interested in speaking online. Um, in terms of remote participants, well, let me back up a second. In terms of speaking in public, it's important that we remind ourselves that we are here as advisors to bring the public's interest to fruition through this plan. Um, but the public also has a responsibility here um, along with us to offer, and this includes all of us, to offer thoughtful and concise input, to be respectful of differing viewpoints, be patient and listen to one another respectfully and intently. Help us to remain focused on the discussion topic and adhering, adhering to our agenda. Um, Zoom attendees will be using the function of raise hand, as you see here displayed, um, as well as a chat box to offer uh, comments throughout. Uh, Facebook Live attendees should also use the comment box. Those um, comments will be monitored by staff here and tabulated um, going forward. So with that, um, I do have one public comment card here physically. I'd ask for help from staff to know if there's any that are interested in speaking um, from our online platforms. 
If you are uh, on Zoom and interested in speaking during public comment, please click the raise hand button. Okay. Um, I believe here personally, physically is Bill Purdy. Um, Bill, if you'd please come forward to the microphone and um, state your name and address. <clears throat> Be mindful that our public comment is limited to 10 minutes in total. So we'd ask you to keep your comments to just a couple minutes. Thank you. Appreciate the time. I'm Bill Purdy. My address is 1985 Birmingham Road here in the city of Milton. Uh, I'm the president of the Milton Arts Council. So I'm here to uh, tell you what we've done and what we need and be a part of the planning process that you're going through. Uh, can I take this off? Um, yes, you can. Thank you. I hate these things. Uh, 30 seconds of history. In the fall of 2016, the council, Milton uh, Council passed a resolution to create the Milton Cultural Arts Committee. Each of the council persons and the mayor picked one person to be on the committee. Uh, it took about six months to get all of the places filled. So we began our deliberations uh, in May of 2017. It took us about nine months to figure out that there was a need for an arts program in our city. We had none. There was a demand for it and we also realized that there was no place to display the art. We also learned the hard way that we can't raise money as a committee of the city. You can't donate money to a government. They'll take all they want, but you can't give it to them. So we negotiated with city council through Sarah Ladar, it helped us work this out. We created the Milton uh, Arts Council, which is a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation, so we could receive funds and grants from, uh, don from donors. And that worked well. Uh, Sarah's on our board as an ex officio director. So that's how we keep the link between what we're doing and what city council would like us to do. So over the course of the uh, last two and a half years, what we've done is uh, we have done some surveys, we've done some visiting and had some meetings. We have uh, created two of the Milton Arts, uh, Mil excuse me, Milton's got talent, it's sure. magnificent. So where do these kids go when they graduate? We need a place for them. We've done uh, two uh, Milton Community Theater productions. We created a theater. I rented Northwestern Middle School stage. I've negotiated an, org, uh, an agreement with Mill Springs Academy to use their stage. We've done two of those. Uh, we also assisted in the Mark Law Memorial uh, to get the horse at the uh, roundabout. So what we've learned uh, over the last uh, two and a half years is there is a need for an arts program in our city. We are the only city in North Fulton that really doesn't have a funded arts program. Uh, normally the cities allocate one to one and a half percent to arts. The city of Milton does not do that right now. We know there's talent here, you've seen it. Um, what we would like to see part of the community of the plan as you work through this is a way to bring our people together. We're kind of scattered out over, what, 44,000 acres, is that what it is? Uh, we need to bring people together and uh, the arts is one way to do that. So keep in mind, if you would, some type of venue. Uh, we'd like a performing arts stage, if possible, and because uh, we have enough talent here to do that. Uh, we also know that the arts are not self-funding, sadly speaking. So we need outside funding. In the last 12 months, I have been able to receive grants from Fulton County for a total of $21,000, all one-time only deals. So from this point forward, we're on our own. So any thoughts you have or any ideas to help us grow this program, we'd appreciate it. Keep us in mind in your planning process. We'd like to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Purdy. Um, we, I think you'll be pleased with some of the topics we're discussing tonight based on the survey findings as an example. I expect you'll be hearing some discussions specific to public art um, and venues as well. Is there any other public comment? There isn't, so we stay on schedule. Um, with that, the next item on our agenda 
uh, would be giving a progress update. But before I do so, I just wanted to give a, go ahead, you can come up, Michelle. I just wanna give a quick recap for this, this committee, um, reminding us that this is a public meeting. We have attendees, as I said, here in person, as well as uh, remotely. Our goal tonight and throughout the development of Milton's 2040 comprehensive plan is to inform, engage, and solicit valuable feedback from stakeholders throughout Milton. The public has provided valuable input through various engagement mediums, and they will continue to offer perspectives through public comment as we heard already. Staff and outside consultants will perform critical analysis in accordance with our scope and the guidelines of the Atlanta Regional Commission and the Department of Community Affairs. This evening, this evening we will be engaging with staff and other subject matter experts regarding public engagement findings market analysis insights, a land use overview for the Deerfield character area and AG1 zoning, as well as providing additional opportunity for public comment. As CPAC members, we serve the critical role to review, critique, and synthesize inputs in order to advise the CPAC project team throughout the development of Milton's 2040 comp plan. So let's just be mindful of that as you feel, as you express your um, thoughts tonight of what our role is and uh, how much staff and the outside consultants, how much effort they put into making tonight's session possible. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Todd. It's always good to be reminded of why we're here. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, so I am Michelle McIntosh Ross, principal planner here with the city of Milton. And you all know me, so I, but I have to introduce myself every time for the folks at home. Um, so I am charged with um, giving you a quick recap um, because the last time we had our meeting, it was before the holidays, so it's always good to have um, this uh, recap. Our last CPAC meeting was on Tuesday, November 10th, if you could believe, which was before Thanksgiving and the Christmas uh, holiday. If you recall, we talked about some of the accomplishments from the previous planning efforts and how important this process will be to build upon the previous good work that we've been doing as building blocks for the future projects and successes. Uh, in our second, um, in the second half of that meeting, we worked on a worksheet which um, had topics about the priorities, issues and objectives section. And we used the 2016 list that was done previously to build on that. This is an important section of the comprehensive plan since it'll set the tone and sentiment for the overall plan. The topics that we covered were development patterns and land use, community facilities and services, housing, intergovernmental coordination, natural cultural resources, economic development and financing. So we went through those topics and some of the discussion, uh, for instance, uh, for the development patterns and land use, we about having a um, some gateways to distinguish Milton from the rest of our neighboring communities. When we talked about the community facilities and services, that conversation focused on parks, active or passive. When we talked about housing, a lot of the comments um, was about the COVID effect, uh, working from home housing for 55 plus, as well as elderly needing care. We talked about incentives for large lots, as well as guest houses and short-term rentals were some of the uh, things that, brought up, that was brought up during that uh, discussion. With the intergovernmental coordination section, basically we said, yes, keep coordinating with the neighboring communities. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, in the natural and cultural resources section, we talked about public art a lot, um, tailoring it to Milton, as well as branding the rural heritage. We talked about the black horse fencing and how that um, was really good with branding and it helped create a sense of place. We talked about architecture, materials like wood, maintaining the rural atmosphere. In economic development, we talked a lot about this topic. A lot of the, the concerns was about the future tax base and the long-term economic sustainability of the city. Some of the suggestions were to look into non-traditional economic um, development, such as rural and agribusiness, annual events perhaps. 
Also, we want to, uh, members stated that we didn't want to become commercialized like John's Creek or Sandy Springs and to keep all the commercial in the designated, the already designated areas that are on our future development map from previous comprehensive plans, which are Deerfield, Crabapple, Birmingham Crossroads, and perhaps Arnold Mill. Um, that'll be a discussion for this process as well. The financing, uh, some great ideas was to make sure to leverage grant funding, bonds, and public-private partnerships. Then we talked about other opportunities, and one of the ideas that came up was uh, tech hubs and incubators as something that we should explore. So that was just a recap of the discussions we had um, last time for that section. All of these, uh, all of those discussions were primarily pri preliminary discussions. We will have the opportunity later in this process to go over those draft priorities, issues and opportunities and make final recommendations to council. So we'll do that later on in this process. I just wanted to thank you guys for that discussion we had um, at our last meeting. So moving on from that, on December 10th, we had our first public meeting as our comprehensive plan public kickoff meeting. And that was on December 10th. You guys were um, very helpful and instrumental in promoting the meeting by sending emails to your HOA groups, telling your friends and family to join the meeting. We had over 30 outside participants and we got a lot of great feedback from the meeting. We had a word cloud exercise that showed the interactivity and you'll see some results of that later on. At that meeting, we introduced the comprehensive plan to the general public. We showed some of the work around the city that resulted from the previous comprehensive plans. We talked about CPAC and CPAC's role, and then we talked about the project team and how the community's role is important to the process. We introduced the website and how to reach out to the planning team, how to submit your comments, and we encouraged everyone to fill out the online community survey and to visit the website and take a look at the ideas wall and read what other folks had been um, posting to the ideas wall as well as to uh, add their own. The window for the survey was open throughout the holidays from Thanksgiving into January and it closed on January 15th. Since that meeting, we've gotten the survey results back and we'll discuss those today um, after this presentation. And we received a lot of comments from Facebook and the ideas wall, and we also summarize those. And those will be very helpful for the comprehensive plan. After that meeting, the planning team got right to work. In fact, it was the morning after, and we worked on um, getting prepared for this meeting today. We had one of our sub-consultants, Noel Consulting with David Lobie, who by the way, worked on our uh, crab apple placemaking plan back in 2016, 2017, alongside TSW. Uh, so um, uh, Noel Consulting put together the market analysis for Milton, and we uh, sent all those videos um, last week or a week and a half ago so that you can see those. Uh, we also worked on um, presentations about Deerfield, the Deerfield area and the land use policy, as, um, as well as the development pattern of the AG1 areas in Milton and how we see um, that development happening. We wanted to discuss that. Uh, we provided those videos and we will uh, have um, uh, the conversation. We'll have the presentation again and have a discussion about the um, policies. We provided those so that we can start the conversation about city policy for the future land use. And all of this information is very um, uh, essential to that discussion. So today, once we go through the presentations, we'll have a discussion time. And we reached out to a lot of you um, in the last few days to see if you had any questions. So thank you for reaching back and, and uh, sending in your questions. And so hopefully we'll have a great um, discussion today. So hopefully that got you caught up with what we've been doing so far. And without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Laura to come up so that we can go over the survey and the entire engagement responses that we've had um, over the past few months, actually. Okay, thank you. All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Laura Richter and I'm a planner with TSW. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm gonna talk about 
our engagement results, um, both uh, Facebook, our ideas wall, and the online survey. Um, all three of these um, engagement methods are wonderful tools um, to get a snapshot of what you all are feeling and thinking today and wanting for the future. But I do stress that they're all pieces of the puzzle. Um, these meetings, the uh, public workshops, the community education sessions, the surveys, they all sort of um, uh, add up into a, a very thorough engagement process that leads us in a direction for Milton. Uh, so first I will start with our Facebook results. Um, we had over um, 200 people comment on various posts relating to the comprehensive plan. Um, some of them were, um, you know, uh, advertisements or marketing to promote the plan or the different public meetings. And so I went through all those comments provided to me by Greg. Um, and here are some of the major themes. Um, there's a lot of positive support for expanded parks, both active and passive. Um, there is demand for sidewalk networks and trail systems. Uh, there you go. <laughs> oh, thank you. People also posted about limiting building in the future, as well as populating currently empty retail spaces. Um, there were also comments supporting the large lot residential, which is over three acres, and also some small lot development. And so that's going to um, gear more towards um, empty nesters and potential first time home buyers, that type of product. Um, there was also support for future restaurant development and uh, for a focus on traffic management as part of this 2040 plan. And we will continue to monitor these comments throughout the entire process um, and bring you back the results. Our next method is the ideas wall. Um, this is part of our engagement forum, which we launched um, and brought to the public as part of our kickoff meeting. You may have visited it. Uh, the ideas wall will be up and running for the duration of the project. So people can continuously uh, post on it about different uh, ideas about land use and transportation. Uh, and these are some of the major themes we've heard so far. And we've only had about 25 comments, but we're hoping to um, engage a lot more throughout the rest of the engagement process. Um, again, positive support for active parks that are connected to surrounding communities so people can bike and walk to these parks from their home. Positive support for expanded sidewalk networks and trail systems, repeated again, um, sort of mirroring some of the Facebook comments we heard, um, support for looking at Birmingham Highway and Birmingham Road for safety and walkability, uh, support for the roundabouts um, that are here today and exploration for those that could be implemented in the future. Um, the community supports uh, recycling initiatives and overall site and building sustainability. Uh, again, a focus on traffic management, and support for public art throughout the city. Now I'm going to turn over to the actual survey, which ran until January 15th, um, which was also on our engagement forum page. Some of you may have taken it. Um, we had 150 unique survey stakeholders and 567 responses. Uh, we had eight mini surveys, if you remember. Our most popular one uh, was the You and Milton survey, which, which is sort of a snapshot of your relationship to the Milton community. Um, second was land use and character, and third was housing. Just a point of clarification on that. I don't know that those are necessarily popularity, because I know me and a number of people in our community, when you click save, it wouldn't save. It would. Okay. Um, we had a couple people contact us with um, technical issues, um, and we were able to help them. So I, I apologize. And, you know, myself and my team, our team would have done whatever we could have to, to help you uh, complete. So what, my what apologies. What we discussed in the steering committee is some of those technical issues, as well as the fact that right. in, in each independent um, medium, whether that was Facebook, the ideas wall or even the survey, we had modest uh, response rates. So right. we have to factor that as we think about these. But when you look across them and start seeing similar themes or similar patterns, that's for us to then uh, digest and advise on, the, on its relevance. But that's a fair critique sure. uh, that we also 
discussed as a steering committee. Right, and that's just one method of feedback. Um, there are these CPAC meetings, we'll have public meetings um, to get other layers to reinforce some of the things we've heard in the survey and other, other mediums as, as Todd was alluding to. Um, next, we have uh, our top ranked um, topics of importance for the 2040 plan. Um, number one being land use and managed growth, number two being transportation improvements, and then passive and active re recreation tying for third. Laura, can you pass forward one slide? Oh. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I didn't. There you go. And now it's Michelle. All right. There you go. Let's back up to that one. So those were the main major themes. Yeah, so those are the major topics that um, the people, the respondents chose as most important to focus on for this comprehensive plan. All right, uh, next we have uh, two word clouds which were generated from two separate questions. Uh, the first question is, what one word would you use to describe Melton today? And do note that the larger the words, the more people responded um, and typed those words um, when answering these questions. Um, so the first question is, what one word would you describe Melton today? Um, our most frequent words were growing, peaceful, horses, beautiful, rural, all things you think of when you think of Melton. Some of the less frequent responses included busy, crowded, um, family, our second question, what one word would you use to describe Milton tomorrow? So looking 20 years in the future, what would you like Milton to be? Our most popular responses were quaint, peaceful, and community. Um, some of the less frequent uh, responses included preserved, eco, and green, among others. Okay, in terms of land use, um, people supported further study of both the Deerfield Highway 9 um, character area and Arnold Mill, which um, Bob will go into more detail uh, a little bit later about um, those. Uh, additionally, again, we're hearing that people have the preference for the larger lots, three or plus acres, um, as well as some civic, cultural, and historic development, craft manufacturing, and local shops and restaurants. Um, and additionally, uh, we had favorable preference for both passive and green space and conservation land. All right, next we asked you all about transportation and mobility. Um, traffic flow is our highest rated topic to address, followed by road infrastructure and conditions. Um, as well as traffic growth within Milton and also through traffic from other communities uh, affecting your, your daily lives. Um, and we have some initiatives. Uh, we had a lot of um, responses for improving bike facilities, connectivity and safety. Um, some city initiatives could include special bike routes, bike lanes and roads, and then just driver education um, on how to share the road with cyclists. All right, uh, in terms of parks and public spaces, 89% of respondents do visit the parks within Milton, and at least 48% of those people at least um, visit them once a month. Um, additionally, there were some people that do go to parks in uh, neighboring communities for services such as dog parks, um, sports leagues, and playgrounds. Um, and within this sample size of about 150 people, we had 71% supportive of another park spawn in the future, mainly to support walking trails and also uh, more conservation land. And also in the same area, based on uh, the support for public art. Yes. Which we heard in the public comment as well. Yes, and yes, a strong support for public art, excuse me. Uh, next up is housing, and which the respondents, um, again, um, prefer the larger three plus acre lots. Um, there was also some support for smaller one to three acre lots, um, and also for workforce housing and li live work units. Um, and that overall, your housing stock quality in Milton is very satisfactory.
All right. Um, in terms of economic development, Milton respondents are open to different industries, um, including the craft manufacturing, again, breweries, farmers markets, and agritourism that supports your rural heritage. Um, there's support for the film industry um, as long as it's not a nuisance to the um, community in terms of traffic and other related issues. Um, there was also 57% um, support for um, short-term rentals like Airbnb um, and similar um, and support of taxation of those initiatives. Next, we asked you all about technology service and access, specifically broadband. Um, connectivity and cell service. Um, and the major theme was that there is a need for improvement on both of those services, um, specifically in, in some of the rural areas of your community. And that is something we will um, explore and analyze. And lastly, uh, we asked you all about sustainability in Milton. Um, there is definite support um, from respondents on sustainability initiatives, including expanding recycling throughout the city, implementing a tree planting program, and composting. Uh, there was also support for sharing a recycling center with a neighboring community. Um, and number two, 71% uh, supported Milton having their own recycling center, all of these with um, support from tax dollars. And now I'm going to turn it over to Noel, which are going to give their presentation on their market analysis. And after that, we will have a discussion about both these topics. Thank you so much. I just wanted to call out while David um, takes the podium that Council Member Bentley has joined us prior to this um, uh, public engagement, um, feedbacks, input, insights. Good evening, uh, David Loby with Noel Consulting. Uh, as was mentioned, my team, including Tate Davis, who's here tonight, uh, has performed the market analysis here as part of the comprehensive plan. Um, Michelle mentioned earlier, but we actually did this back in 2016 for the crab apple plan as well. So we're not new to the Milton community. Um, the uh, piece I wanna mention, again, Laura said it, but I thought this was great. You know, there's many pieces to the puzzle of putting together a comprehensive plan. And the market study is just one of those pieces. Um, the overall document that I have here and that's, you know, available for you all to view is over a hundred pages. There's a lot of information to understand what's going on in the market for all the different land uses. And so I'm just gonna hit a few highlights tonight, but. You know, there's some there's some trends in there that you're going to see that you might like. There's some trends in there you're going to see that you might not like. Um, the market study is to just paint the picture so we understand the environment that you're in. Towards the end of my presentation, I'm going to be talking about demand potential by land use uh, for the, the next five year period. And again, I want to uh, emphasize that that's demand potential. As a community, you all have the ability to decide, is that something you want to see in your community? Is that appropriate or not? So we're just painting the environment so that you know kind of what you're going up against, the development pressures that you might see, so you know whether it's going to be a hard lift to get something done or not. And it also helps inform you on how much we can uh, push on the private sector to do and provide for us versus where we might help have to help fill in the gaps that the private sector won't do on their own. Let's see if I can figure out how to work this. Do we have the presentation up? I think Michelle's got it for you. It'll come up. Here we go. Yeah, I think I got it, Michelle, maybe. Oh, I'm going backwards. Here we go. All right. So as I said earlier, I mean, the overall thing's over 100 pages. Uh, there's a couple that I've pre-selected that I want to kind of jump to and talk about. And I realize up here on the screen, for those of you in the room, you're not going to be able to read any of that. So I'm just going to talk about it, and it's more a backdrop for us. Um, but those at home can probably see this a little bit better. Um, first off, starting here, this is uh, talking about overall growth that we're seeing in metropolitan Atlanta in terms of population. And one of the things that we noticed here is the city of Milton 
Um, this is looking from 2010 census to 2018, kind of the most recent census-like numbers we have on your community. And in that time period, um, you grew at an annual rate of about 3.4% in population. And that's over double what Metro Atlanta has seen. Uh, now, part of that is because you started with a relatively low base, but it's still a significant amount of growth that you're seeing. I gotta make sure I figure out which direction this goes. Here we go. All right, and um, some of you all might be able to see this map. This is a heat map by census tract that's showing population density. So the darker the green, the greater the population density. And this is kind of looking at Metro Atlanta and you can see Milton is outlined in yellow there up at the top. And um, if you were able to see this closer, one of the things you'll notice is even around Milton, you have areas that are darker green, so higher density. So this is kind of a visual presentation of some of that growth pressure that you're starting to feel on your community. Again, jumping around a little bit to just some key highlight slides, but you can review all of this on your own. Uh, all right, one of the other things we, um, we noticed when looking at some of your overall housing statistics and demographic statistics is today about 27% of your occupied housing is um, rented product as opposed to owned product. And that percentage is actually pretty low when compared to Fulton County, the MSA, the state of Georgia average, the United States average. Um, and uh, something to keep in mind is that rental product, particularly today, we're seeing a lot of changes in that industry. It doesn't just have to come in the form uh, that you might think of, of like a four story or five story apartment building. Some of the biggest changes we're seeing in the industry right now are actually newer product types like townhomes or even single family homes or cottage homes that are built to be professionally run as rental product. And so that's an interesting shift. So when you think rental, don't just think about the product type, think about it as just a different you know, form of tenure, not necessarily owning, but renting. And, and the reason that is something to keep in mind, again, to think of whether or not this is appropriate for your community, um, this is a, a, a trend map or trend graph of US level and these different lines on here are showing the change in household type going all the way back since 1950, all the way up to kind of more current. And you'll see that uh, the lines that are increasing the most are what we kind of call non-traditional household types. So your traditional married couple, family with kids household type has actually remained pretty flat since 1950s. What's been increasing quite a bit is these non-traditional. So married couples without children, single parent households, um, and in even some cases, multi-generational households. So it's something to keep in mind that demographics are changing, the way people are living, the way that even every household is represented is a little bit different than we used to be. So the, our, is our housing product keeping up with that? <clears throat> Another big uh, conclusion that we saw, and I certainly felt this driving up from Atlanta this afternoon, but um, you know, today you are what we would consider a bedroom community. This is a, a job map, a job heat map. So the darker the purple, the concentration of where currently city of Milton residents are commuting for their job. Now, obviously this is pre-COVID situation when people were commuting on a more regular basis, but as I saw today, a lot of people are still commuting. Um, and what you see is the majority of Milton residents leave Milton to go to their job and then have to commute back. Um, this is something to keep in mind because this obviously impacts traffic. Another thing that we heard uh, from the community in some of the public sessions was that there was a, um, a real lack of parks in Milton. And so we wanted to look at this from a, from a data standpoint and kind of show it in some maps here. So 
uh, the, the bottom right corner is a heat map based on the need for park. This is something that the Trust for Public Land puts together and creates. And what we found was that in the city of Milton, about 22% of residents are within a 10 minute walk of a park. The national average is 55%. So you are considerably under parked. And as we go to the Southern portion of the community is where the greatest need for more park space actually lies. start talking about housing product a little bit here. So uh, we looked at your, this is of your detached home sales, looking out back in the past, uh, past decade or two here. And it's been pretty consistent since about 2013 that about 70% of your home sales are occurring on lots larger than an acre. And about 30% are home products less than an acre. Um, what is interesting, though, is when you look at price appreciation and value growth by that same metric, there's been greater price increases on the product that's an acre or larger. And, and that kind of makes sense if you understand sort of the economics of housing. It has a lot to do with the underlying land. And what is increasing is the land values because Milton is a desirable place to live. And you have a lot of folks that want to come here. Um, one of the challenges though to just keep in mind and consider with that is um, it's actually this is showing the percentage of sales above a million um, and those within the 500 to a million band and one of the challenges is because of that underlying land appreciation and the percentage, the high percentage you have in the million plus category, um, your sales above a million dollars are increasing in terms of the percentage of your market. And the product between 500 and a million is decreasing considerably. So uh, you're getting into some affordability challenges for folks that don't have a million bucks. Okay, uh, I'm back to kind of the executive summary that we put in the front of our package. This is exhibit one. This is, as I was mentioning earlier, this is kind of looking by land use for the next five year period where we can really accurately forecast kind of demand that demand potential that's out there. Um, and again, I wanna mention that this is demand potential, doesn't mean you necessarily are gonna see this. And in many ways, you guys have the ability to influence whether you're gonna see this or not by zoning and other things that the plan is gonna be addressing. Um, this is specific to Milton. So uh, I think there was a question, you know, we work around the country. I work for a lot of uh, different communities, even here in the Metro Atlanta region. Um, we don't just come in and say the same thing to every municipality. This is very much tailored to your specific marketplace. Um, and uh, this, uh, Demand potential here starts at the top by kind of single family homes, and then we have townhomes, apartments, senior housing, and then we get into more some commercial uses here. I'm just gonna hit a couple highlights on here. The single family homes, you're gonna to continue to see demand potential for about 30 to 40 single family homes per year. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, an increasing portion of this is coming in at kind of closer to those million dollar prices. Um, that is causing the sales volume of that product to actually decrease. We're actually seeing your sales of that product start to slow down because of simple supply demand economics. We're getting to a price point that not as many people can afford. So that is starting to slow down. Um, kind of the opposite of that, the townhome product, the demand is actually about 40 to 60 units a year. And this is something that's actually increasing. And I think it's directly a function of the price point. Uh, but it also has a lot to do with some of those demographic trends I was talking about earlier about different household types and what folks are looking for. Um, that product is largely gonna be between 350,000 to 600,000. 
Um, what we like about that kind of product type, or at least something for you all to consider about that product type, I should say, um, is the variety of household types that uh, are often looking for that. It can work for starter families. It can work for empty nester downsizers. Um, obviously, there's only going to be only certain areas in the plan where the density would allow something like that. Um, as we get into the apartment side, uh, this is one where we saw that the demand potential for apartments could be up to 500 units in this kind of five year period. So about 100 units or so a year. Again, you're not going to necessarily see that. Um, you might not even have the appropriate sites that would allow for that, but that demand potential is out there. You can certainly look around the Atlanta region and see where different communities have decided whether or not they want to harness that. And a lot of the construction activity you see right now are these apartment communities. Um, again, keep in mind that uh, the apartment communities don't have to just be in a mid-rise building. They can be in different product types, but in many cases, it, it's more about renting as another alternative, another option to purchasing. And one of the things that we're seeing uh, in the industry, we talk about it being kind of class A product. You know, this is not some of the apartments that you might think about, about sort of dated apartments from the 60s or 70s. Um, you know, this is, this is new stuff that's largely uh, a lifestyle choice for many of these folks. Many of these folks actually have the means to purchase, but they're just deciding to rent. Um, it does provide for kind of what we call missing middle housing options and largely becomes product for folks earning between 50 and $150,000 in income. Um, along with the kind of conventional apartments, there's a growing trend in the industry for what we call kind of age targeted or age restricted apartments for the empty nester community. So 55 plus, these are often deed restricted that they have to be 55 plus to live there. And um, it's kind of a new uh, industry product type before you get into independent living. It's still kind of called active adult. So it's still very active, but they just don't want to deal with the big house and maintenance. So that is a product type you guys have potential for if you wanted to harness that up to about 200 units or so in one community every five year period. Um, in addition to that, there is demand for traditional senior housing. This would be in what we call independent living or assisted living facilities. You have uh, demand potential for one of those. Those are typically sized at about 90 to 110 beds per community. Uh, and then getting into the commercial side. So we've got retail, conventional office, and, and lodging or hospitality. Um, retail nationally, uh, it's no surprise that it's been going through challenges even before COVID, we were going through challenges with the rise of online sales uh, and how consumers are, are choosing to spend their retail dollar. One of the things that that has done is it has really hit the traditional brick and mortar type stores, particularly um, uh, dry goods, big box type stores. A lot of those, as you're probably reading about, uh, a lot of those businesses are starting to go bankrupt and it's being particularly hard for regional malls and power centers. And so what that's doing is it's changing the, the landscape of the retail industry a little bit. And the majority of the retail demand here, which we found about 140,000 feet in this five year period, the majority of that is going to manifest itself in more food and beverage offerings and what we call population servicing. So that could be a gym or a chiropractor or a tax prep guy. Um, the uh, other piece of that retail is, well, it actually goes with office as well. A lot of those businesses, a lot of those tenant types are really looking to be in more dynamic mixed use environments. It was a trend we saw even before COVID and even before we saw the increase of online sales pressure. Um, and one of the reasons is if you think about the old sort of suburban retail shopping center model, you might have a grocery anchor and then some small shop space around it. And the grocer was who brought in the traffic that then helped support the smaller businesses. Well, a lot of those traditional anchors are what is disappearing. And so we have to think about our anchors differently. Our anchors today might be a park. It could be a trail system. Our anchor might be a 300 unit apartment community, or our anchor could be an amphitheater or a performing arts. Um, facility. So those are the kind of differences that we're seeing in anchors and how it's impacting the retail environment. Crabapple is a perfect testament to this. 
Uh, on the conventional office side, I mentioned earlier, you know, you're largely a bedroom community. We are seeing some good momentum on growth of private office space here pre-COVID. Um, it is mostly smaller local firms. Um, and <clears throat> the majority of that is looking for these mixed-use environments um, as well as kind of out in Deerfield. We found the demand for about 105,000 feet of that going forward. Obviously, COVID has shifted the landscape a little bit about how we think about office product, um, but uh, there were some questions about this that came up. Um, you know, I think there's some folks that are really wondering, are people ever going to go back to a traditional office again, or are we all going to work from home forever? Uh, you know, I think what we're seeing nationwide is playing out here in Atlanta too, which is that, you know, certain industry sectors, particularly technology industry, um, they really might go to uh, a, a, a full-time kind of work from home situation and you're not gonna see them occupy nearly as much office space as we have seen pre-COVID. But most industry sectors are coming back to it. And we're even seeing lease transaction happening today. You can look in Atlanta at how many office, large office leases have still been done after COVID even in tech sector. I mean, we've had Google sign a big one, Facebook sign a big one, MailChimp signed a big one. I mean, there's still a lot of momentum going on. Um, we do think that it's going to decrease. We think it's gonna be about a 20% drop in the historic absorption that we used to see, um, but we don't think it's a you know wholesale change in the office industry. Of course, we still don't know for sure, but based on uh, surveying and checking, taking a pulse of, uh, leasing activity. That's kind of what we're seeing out there. Uh, the hospitality or the lodging side, that is a very different story. This was the use that was the hardest hit by COVID. Um, and we certainly see that here locally too. In addition to that, your hospitality market is kind of tied to the 400 business corridor, and it's going to also compete with Alpharetta and even downtown Roswell. And those areas had a couple of hotels under construction even before COVID hit. So with the combined impact of the COVID drop off and the kind of new supply that's already coming, uh, that market's going to be pretty uh, oversupplied here for a while. So we don't see any demand for an additional hotel within your community in this five year period. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on tonight, uh, there was a lot of discussion. I even mentioned mixed use a lot, and the industry talks about mixed use a lot. Um, you know, here, Michelle mentioned, you've got some areas uh, that, that currently would allow for that. Obviously here in Crabapple, Deerfield, possibly Birmingham Crossroads. Um, I mentioned that a lot of the retail and even office tenants are looking for that environment. And from a residential standpoint, there is an increasing portion of the market looking for walkable locations. That's not everybody, but there is an increasing portion of that. Um, and, and one of the reasons why it is a, a good product for us to consider is when you mix these uses in an environment, we've seen demonstrated examples of 20 to 30% premiums on the use uh, for the, the support that they can kind of give to each other. Um, and that's really helpful if we think about areas where we might wanna see redevelopment occur in your community. So perhaps there's portions of, of Deerfield or other locations where you might wanna see some redevelopment. Um, I mentioned earlier about some of the challenges that we're seeing with big box stores, for example. Well, you might see some of that retail in Deerfield over time, you might see those businesses go under, you might see vacancies increase, and we might want to be thinking about what is a use that can come in and backfill that. And I think mixed use is a great opportunity for some of that product type. And then I was just going to mention here, lastly, uh, and again, you're not going to be able to read this, but just a graphic for me to talk to. Um, there's mixed use that can be done right and mixed use that can be done wrong. So something to keep in mind, each use within a mix of uses needs to be able to have its own market support. So you know, one of the uh, pitfalls we often see communities make is where they might require ground floor retail in an entire stretch uh, of a corridor. And that entire corridor might not be able to support that much retail. It might not have the proper visibility or access for that retail. And then that retail sits vacant. 
And that's the last thing we want to see. So just kind of keep in mind too, that when we think about mixed use, we want to make sure we're putting it not only in places the community is accepting of it, but places that have the market support for it to actually work. Uh, and that is everything I wanted to cover. Do we go to questions now or do I go back to Laura? Uh, we've got a discussion session here. Today. Okay. Just by a, a raise of hands, does anyone have any doubts that David and Tate have a good understanding of our market? I, I'd say they, they've really done a, a great job in detailed analysis of, of Milton and understanding the uniqueness of our, of our area. So great job. Thank you. So now we're gonna transition into some of the pre-work that you guys have done and getting some discussion and critique, review, critique, and input for to advise the, the broader team. Okay, uh, our first question, um, which is part of your worksheet, is about the engagement findings we went over. And uh, in this section, please give us your thoughts um, if, on the engagement findings today. What is the most important to your community? Um, and what is an issue that needs more attention? Or what is something unique about the results um, you'd like to talk about further? I guess, you know, Milton is such a unique community and, you know, I appreciate David's, you know, a little video and all that. that was great. The thing that I really would have loved to have seen is looking at some well-established communities around Brook, Alabama or Aiken, South Carolina, that maybe, you know, in 10, 20 years, we want to kind of follow some of those paths and to figure out, okay, what is it that allowed them to maintain that path? When we look at some of these national averages, you know, the parks and all that kind of stuff, I think that's a little skewed because, gosh, we got larger land lots and everything here. So that's going to be thrown off. And yeah, you know, gosh, people love to live here. I, I work down by the perimeter, quality of life. So we really don't want to make our community like Alpharetta or, you know, like, uh, you know, Chagrin Falls or, you know. So your feedback would be, you're, you would look to, like to look to other communities as models and what could we learn from them? Other communities like, that, you know, we could, you know, that we know, hey, you know, we're on the same path, man. If, you know, 20 years we could <clears throat> maintain what they've maintained, then that's their percentages, because the one thing, and I thought through the video that was really great was when they talked about mixed uh, product, having leaves on the bottom, having housing on top. I mean, I love that. That's great and very consistent. I think in Milton, the concept of a bed and breakfast, I mean, zoning, you know, opening up some bed and breakfast, but I think the, you know, that concept would have a lot more charm and appeal to the city than having a, a Hilton or Hyatt go up. And I think we're gonna hear a little bit more about those concepts when we get into the character areas and the zoning, um, but this great feedback. Okay, do we have any online comments or questions? Okay, I will move to the next one, which is specific to market uh, analysis um, and speaks to a little bit what, of what you just said. Uh, what are your thoughts on related to growth conservation development in the next 20 years? You know, one of the things that struck me when I heard this now for the second time, but um, is the, pre the increased land values underlying and supporting the, the growth in the um, home products over a million and the availability decreasing for a home product in the 500 to a million. I think one of the trends, and I'd like to get confirmation on this, that are unintended trends in our mind is that puts pressure, increased land value puts pressure to subdivide large tracts. And a large tract could be five acres subdivided into five parcels through flag lots as an example. So, Although I think we all would generally appreciate increased property values, it could have some unintended consequences in terms of added pressure to subdivide. Is that consistent with your words of caution, David? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly through um, zoning controls, you can help 
but you are definitely going to get that pressure. Um, when the land value is at this kind of price point, economically, there's only so much you can do with it. And so, yeah. And, and the other piece of feedback that I um, heard is new information that's similar to what Brian, I think, was raising, the mixed use product and the opportunity to perhaps do some redevelopment in Deerfield, but I think we'll hear that later. But the anchor being a different product than what we're maybe accustomed to, the anchor being a park space, the anchor being an amphitheater, um, it was interesting to me. I think that could kind of kill two birds with one stone in terms of what our objectives are as a community as well. Yeah, I just one thing to keep in mind though, um, when you think about maybe a park space as, as an anchor, it's great because the, the people that it draws in and the vibrancy that that creates, but from an economic standpoint with the land values, as we were just discussing, so high, you're generally gonna have to offset that park space by providing more density around it in order to allow for the park space. Yeah, I, that's for the community development director to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any online comments or questions? Yes. Any other comments on the, oops, market analysis? Okay, see, this is what happens, I guess, right? I just have one <laughs> question um, about the process and maybe the methodology. Uh, I, I'm assuming Brian is this person here, right? I, I had a similar thought in that almost like when you're looking at houses, they create, create comps, you know, it'd be interesting to understand existing communities that are comps to us, whether it was them five years ago or 10 years ago and us today, but it'd be interesting to get a two or three or four examples that, that sort of parallel the data and the findings that maybe they went through and they were assessed that way again, five or 10 years ago. And then I also think that that one of the things that may help us is to sort of identify the priorities, which I know the process is about, but I'm big on this, like the idea of tech hubs. So that anchor that you were just referring to could be a tech hub that yeah. has a business or an economic model that does justify the space, the land use, et cetera, but isn't really retail. It isn't really that kind of a draw, but it's a lifestyle type of draw to a community or to a mini community. And so it'd be interesting to know, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming there's some data out there now after the last five or 10 years, whether it's tech hub type stuff or an incubator or whatever it is, innovation center or something else, I don't, it doesn't have to be that, that are serving as examples of anchors that are this new generation of anchors. I think it'd be interesting to get more data or findings around that to help inform us. Because I think part of what we have to do in any community, but this community is, we do have some unique drivers and circumstances, and I think they require real innovation in our thinking about what a community is and will be in 10 years or 20 years. And that's not easy for any of us. You know, we're all locked into what we know about Milton and what we know about other communities we've lived in. So I don't know if that's helpful or actionable, but. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions for this part of the discussion? I uh, completely understand your, your thought there. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that there's an evolution of the type of office product as well as the location of the office product. So while we may see a 
20%, maybe it's greater, maybe it's 30%, maybe it's 40% decrease in the amount of office space demanded. One thing we are definitely seeing that we were seeing even before COVID and we're gonna to continue to see is also a change in the type and location of the space. So for example, one of the things we hear a lot from different businesses is that they're competing for talent. They're trying to hire young educated professionals and they have to provide environments that attract those people or locate their offices and environments that attract those people. And it's one of the reasons that a lot of your traditional suburban office parks are all having to try to figure out how to reinvent themselves because that is not the product that a lot of these businesses want anymore. They wanna be in Crabapple. They wanna be in these kind of environments. And particularly another challenge is when we look at where a lot of your growth has been in businesses, a lot of it is in smaller businesses. It's folks with you know, fewer than 15, 20 employees. And so those people are looking for smaller spaces that you oftentimes can't get in a 20,000 square foot footplate in a building in Deerfield. It's harder to subdivide that down perhaps to the sizes that they're looking for and or it's not the environment they're looking for. So I'm not saying you won't see an increase in vacancy in Deerfield. I think you're gonna see that. I think that's more a function of the product type that we have over there than it is necessarily COVID impact. And I still think, you know, regardless of the COVID impact, because of that shift in product desire, you're still gonna have that demand for 105,000 feet. It's just probably not gonna be in Deerfield. Or it'll be in a different form Correct. through redevelopment into mixed use campuses versus standalone campuses. Correct, good point, not yeah. current Deerfield. David, I, I think you made comment the other day in the steering committee meeting about the, the actual office population itself changing. Is that again, if you're remembering what I'm referring to, it had to do with the company may be the same, but the headcount may go down in the office setting where the amount of square footage committed to each individual person. Yeah. Change. Hmm. Yeah, that's another good point. So um, if you look at data on the average square footage of office space per employee over the past 20 years, we've had a significant run up. It used to be about 200 square feet per office employee was kind of the rule of thumb that everyone used when they were planning their office and planning for growth. Mm -hmm. And it was largely the tech firms that drove this and showed us these open floor plan. We can put everybody in a cubicle farm. We can pack people in. The average is now closer to uh, five people per thousand. So it's it's really packed in even denser. So, sorry, I said that wrong. It used to be two per thousand, basically two, two and a half per thousand. We're now at like five, five and a half, even six per thousand. There's some stuff we see down in, in some of these um, tech heavy industries that are, that are pushing like seven, eight per thousand, right? So we got to where we were really cramming people in. And so one of the thoughts out there is while we might not need as much office square footage, because we don't have as many people coming in every day. Maybe we go to work from home two days a week and three days of a week you show up. But we also might see people wanting to spread back out to kind of reverse that trend and get a little bit more space and not pack people in. And that alone might offset the COVID drop. So again, there's still a lot of uh, how do we read the tea leaves out there? No one knows for sure. But from the data that we're seeing so far, we don't think it's gonna be a wholesale change. I know a lot of the home builders are putting more home offices in homes now just because so many people are at, at home and plan to be at home. I know my wife, my, my daughter is a Gen Xer and uh, she was really looking for a job where she could work at home. She interviewed with Zoom and they require everybody to come into the office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd be curious from the broader group, we, we've talked a lot about the data and that's clearly speaks to the people that are in this room. We're all data driven, I imagine. Um, the survey findings, the public engagement findings, do those themes that the, the team brought out, do those resonate? I, you know, manage growth, managing traffic, parks, conservation of land, those type of themes. Do, do you see anything that stood out as not being, uh, being out of whack, I should say? So I, I, sorry, Colvin, I'll, um, 
I, I didn't see, and I, I didn't, I didn't see it on if it, if it was emailed out. I didn't see it, but I didn't, I didn't see any data on who responded, or any demographics, or where where the respondents were clustered in in Milton. I'd be kind of curious to see that. Um, so it's it's a little bit hard to draw some conclusions from it, but I sort of wonder. Um, you know, I. By the way, when I when I look when I just think about two points, uh, when I think about some of the opportunities that I think we have, and I agree, there have been some kind of comments and allusions to you know if if we were if we were sort of planning if we were doing this plan twenty years ago before the whole sort of Deerfield and Highway Nine corridor had been developed, would we want would we want it to unfold the same way? I don't know that we would, even though today what we have, I mean, if you walk that, if you drive that area, if you walk it, it is kind of a walking area. I mean, I go to Starbucks every morning at Bethany Bend, not recently. There's people that walk there every single day. We all say hi. Our dogs all pee in the same tree. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so anyway, we, it is kind of a walking part of town, to be honest. Um, but it could be so much more would we unfold that the same way. Now that on the other side, back to your question about the data, I look at the data and it says, don't want density, don't want more apartments, don't want more, all of that stuff, but do want more parks and maybe more walking areas. So there are some discontinuities there, which makes me wonder, okay, so where are the responses clustered from in the city and just kind of what were, where are people coming from? So I'm not, I, I don't have an answer to all these questions, but it's kind of what going th goes through my head. Sure, and critical thinking, thank you. Sure, and we have all that information. Um, we had an expanded survey result packet sent out, but we can, I believe, um, but we can resend it and I can, I can even dial it down further beyond that to know specifically where people are from. I'd be interested actually in, um, there were um, a few questions where there was an other option where you could provide additional responses and I would love to see what those additional responses were, because okay. I think a lot of times you can glean a lot from those. Um, you know, sometimes you see overlap, you know, like, oh, you could have like plugged that into, you know, one of the other responses, but maybe they they didn't identify with that or they felt like they needed to expand their thought on, on the question itself. Sure. And that's why I found the Facebook post so telling because it's just all individual responses and you start seeing people have you know, very similar views and you get like a large comment trail on the same topic. Um, and I think that's a really useful tool for us moving forward. Um, asking bigger questions. Go ahead. You know, thanks, Bill, for your comments at the beginning of the meeting. And I think the arts are so important. I think if this opportunity when we think about how can we make Milton special and how can we brand that, you know, one of the things we talked about on the equestrian committee was kind of expanding what you guys did with the original horse, you know, just imagine a bronze horse and every single roundabout, you know, but that consistency of message makes Milton something very unique as opposed to having a modern art sculpture in one, something in another, which then it just becomes like any other city but having a, a bronze sculpture like that representing a Milton resting and pretty neat. Just out of curiosity to our council members, is um, the branding, is that something that's being contemplated within the five-year strategic plan? So, um, good. Yep, because we did get quite a bit of feedback in those comments um, around branding and Milton and character and, I just as a paid in a five year uh, strategic plan just recently as a council, or we stepped away for a day, and branding was a key part of that. You know, I, I think one of the, the things that we need to make sure we look at is where do not only do we what do we want to see from physical things, how about the people? I mean, do we want to attract? and keep senior citizens? Do we want only to look for millennials? I mean, part of, of the pricing issue changes a lot of that, and it's gonna be very difficult for some seniors to stay in Milton if we're not careful. Correct. And so I, I think we've got to look at 
what do we want to look at from a people perspective also? I'm not so sure. Sure, and I know David talked a little bit to your demand for 55 plus, but there were definitely some comments in the different platforms talking about wanting the you know different housing types, whether it was um, workforce housing or um, empty nesters, and then also young professionals. So yeah, diff thinking about those different users in your um, community is important for this process. Yeah, John, to your point, the aging in place community that uh, is a big, I think historically been a big part of Milton. We're now getting to a price point where if larger properties are, um, if the individual is less able to handle the larger property, we have to look at what those choices are to be able to age in place, meaning age within Milton, not necessarily in their same homestead, but what are the products that we have that are not necessarily just 55 plus community. That may not be attractive to somebody who was a large tract sure. land owner prior to that. Maybe it be something similar, but not out of 55 plus community. I think also the structure itself, you know, mobility becomes a, an issue as well. And I would imagine that the vast majority of our housing stock is multi-level, very few single level or ranch homes. Just physical mobility with aging or, or other disabilities that individuals have something to consider as well. One more, one more comment, sorry, to, I'm supposed to be in the peanut gallery, but um, something I encourage you all to think about as we look at the things that are gonna have some sense of urgency. I recognize it's a small sample size when we look at what the survey results were. But one of the, one of the big you know, um, hot buttons for me personally is the active and passive park continuation of the acquiring of that kind of land. And when we let too much time go by, that land is only gonna get more expensive and less available. Um, so we need to probably um, certify that that percentage is uh, ex uh, extrapolated to a larger community. Can we do that? And if so, we need to start looking at those key target points for those um, larger acquisitions. We're, we're talking about community development. We're talking about the business component of it. We're talking about the type of housing, but that would have to be a whole separate discussion if we're talking about where do we identify those parks and if the southern part of our community is identified as underparked, underserved from the park community today, that's also one of the tougher areas to find that kind of space. So I just encourage this, this committee as you guys are thinking about some of the things we'll be tasked with in the coming months is to how to set those priorities and how to find that mix of when and where do we identify those key elements. An item that also surfaced in the in the survey responses was around um, bicycle paths, bike um, routes, and bicycle safety. Is that something that resonates as being um, a, a priority or important in this community in terms of how that fits in with the with our rural character? Um, be interested in feedback on that. It seemed to be pretty strongly supported. Again, the sample size isn't necessarily, and that's what this group is here to advise. Yeah, I, I struggle a little bit with that. I mean, out of 200 Facebook comments, I don't mean the bike thing, it could be whichever, but the data in general, it's hard to understand what's statistically meaningful. So if we have 200 Facebook posts or comments and 12 of them said something, they may have made that list. Well, that's, what, and, that's our job in a sense to advise based on, we're all from different areas of the community and, bring a different perspective. So as a, as a committee, we have to kind of digest and determine um, if it's a priority or not. And that's why I was asking the question, because I don't know that we'll ever get a statistically valid sample. But, but I guess I'm just suggesting that we don't know. And by putting it in here, it's already, it's already flavoring my brain. Yes. Right. Oh, these are the priorities. Okay. We're good. You know, so it's really easy to be suggested this, that this is the information that we need to prioritize. And that's normal, right? Mm -hmm. But if we had some sense of that was really these six comments, the lower ones were four to eight people. The other was 40 people out of 200. You, you can at least create some sense of value kind of prioritization. 
So it's a little bit hard, I, I think, because I'll read this and go along with everybody. You know, yeah, bike, bike trails, but I hate all that biking on some of these main roads, right? But well, on the other hand, if that's what today, people want, yeah. we should do it, right? So yeah. I struggle a little bit with not having enough context to kind of how to position this because I've never been in this kind of a process. Some of you are much more familiar with it and you can probably manage that, but I would appreciate either coaching on it or, or some guidelines around how to, how meaningful some of this is. Cause I look at 25 comments and I say, I work in customer experience and a lot of surveying and anything with just 25, we, that's just an asterisk. Right. You know? and, so, and we knew that going in. So yeah. you're right. That's a fair so, point. But any guidance on how to contextualize these is helpful. I think for me, at I'm, least. I'm part of the cycling community and it's very big up here. Yeah. And there's there. Well, there was a big group that just left today. You know, that group usually, is triple that size when it gets nice. I mean, between us, Alpharetta, Roswell, um, it's it's pretty big. Um, so cycling is big. People spend money. They go to all the restaurants after they cycle. So it can add add revenue to businesses. Well, and on top of that, as our community <laughs> grows and it inevitably will, there's greater conflict on the roads with them if we don't accommodate figure out a way to accommodate. I think there is a large cycling community. You can go over to the old blind dog and, you know, see the pack over there that they used to hang there. But I think with the narrowness of the roads, the speed of the roads, I know I'm always extremely careful. I worry about our teens on the road because boy, you know, sometimes it's hard to see the cyclists. I think from an overall safety perspective, love to see that incorporated into certain sections working with the bike community to kind of set up some routes and make sure that they're protected and also us as drivers and our kids are protected to some level. But it, it, you also, I think, have to keep in mind the number of people that like to ride bikes just pleasure, those that do it for sport. I, I, th I think there's a lot of meat for, for trails where people can take their, their kids and put the bike on the back of the car and go there and go around and don't need the road. It's a smaller group that want to take all the roads. I, I, two well, but that's why I think working with their community to kind of figure out what route. We, you, I wouldn't suggest that you put it on every single route, but I don't know of anyone who's gotten killed walking on a passive park or road, but as a cyclist, to me, that's always very scary and taking care of several of them medically and you know, it's a dangerous sport. Public safety. Uh. Well, where an item to give you some um, feedback, I've been, this is the third one I've been involved in, an item like this, bike, bike routes, bike safety, bike um, planning and management could end up being a work program that staff studies over the next period of time so that it can incorporate that into broader policy around roads and road development over the next 20 years. And so all, all we're looking for, I think the group's looking for, is just some degree of validation that, yeah, that's worth keeping an eye on. We don't necessarily have to solve the problem today, but it's worth keeping an eye on so we can study it and, and plan for it. That's the type of engagement, I think, and advising that this committee is, is looked to provide. But I also think one of the... We, and we've know, got to be a little bit sensitive to time. I don't want, I definitely don't want to stifle discussion, but because you're going to be just as excited about the next topics, I, I perceive. <laughs> um, but Brian, go ahead with the last comment. I say, I, it just seems like we've lumped active and passive parks together. And I'm a little concerned about that because when I see Bell Memorial Park, I just cringe. And, you know, gosh, uh, Colt, you and your committee have done a magnificent job you know, uh, assembling some great acreage and hopefully uh, that'll get renewed and expanded more. But I almost feel like there's a separation there. Yep, well, good feedback. Yep. Um, so on our agenda, we actually have planned for a five minute break. I would um, make a motion to make it a need a break, take a break, and continue forward. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? So if you need a break, please feel free to take a break and we'll move forward. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're moving forward. Thank you. <clears throat> the next um, item is around use, starting with Deerfield. Good evening. I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bob Buscemi. I'm the uh, Acting Community Development Director and the City Architect. Uh, I've been with the city for about 10 years now, so I've been actively engaged in the development of Milton. And I will tell you that Milton is a special place um, since its creation, and it's not something that's just happened. Um, uh, the community has uh, directed staff through master plans and LCI studies on how they want Milton to look. Ordinances and codes have been generated as a result of that in the past. And now we're uh, really the task to do a lot of, it, of that implementation. So when people look at me, sometimes they come in, I go, look, we've done a lot of our homework and now we're in the implementation. And um, and I think this is the time in the process of this committee uh, where the committee um, gets to start being more engaged in the discussion of land use issues. And I think everybody has kind of told me they, they were anxious to be into the, this particular moment in, in the process. Um, I, I think all the, all the data that we've gotten up till this point, uh, hopefully is gonna be helpful to you all. Um, the survey results, uh, the market study. Um, it's going to set a good foundation for the land use. Um, overall, I think the health of our land use and the health of our city is extremely strong. Um, we have great land use uh, planning, and I don't really foresee or would recommend the committee to do any major overhauls on land use um, within the city of Milton. And, and I'll tell you a couple of things uh, result from that. One is um, the development community and the community itself and the financial institutions that support all our development and community members um, sort of like stability. Um, markets like stability. And people come here and look at me and say, Bob, you know, we, we're in Milton and we're investing a whole lot of money in Milton because of that stability. Our money's safe here in Milton because we know how the development pattern is looking and it's been strong and it's been stable. And that has been a great uh, market driver. Prices of houses economically, you know, oh, they're going up a million dollars, but you have to remember the price of money is very cheap today. The, the interest rates are down to two and a half percent. That's driving the price of, of markets. Um, we're actually in a very good situation. I mean, I almost think every city in the state of Georgia, I used to work for the state, uh, so I know the state as a whole. I mean, every city in the state of Georgia wishes they were a Milton. <laughs> they all wish that they had our, our situation of, you know, strong economics and great land planning. And so it's, uh, I just want to give everybody that, that, um, that sort of background a little bit. Tonight, we're, we're going to eventually talk about all the focus areas. Tonight, we're just going to cover Deerfield and the AG1. Am I too well with that? I did send out everybody a video. Can you, you can hear me. Right? I sent everybody a video of what we were going to do tonight ahead of time, just so that um, you you kind of know how we're going to set this up. I believe we're going to start with the. Uh, can you get the, the video? Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Can you just get the video? So I know which one was starting with Deerfield. I think Deerfield. So we're going to start with the Deerfield Highway Nine area. Now, Deerfield Highway 9, um, if you look, let's go to the first slide. Deerfield Highway 9 was actually developed from a planning perspective uh, in two parts. Uh, the south part was developed first, and uh, Highway 9 is the big spine that goes through, and, um, and, and it is a corridor-style development. Highway 9 is a corridor-style development. It's maybe the development pattern, you know, uh, commercials maybe 500 feet deep or so on average, but for the most part, it's uh, development along a corridor, okay? 
uh, which is very different than a crab apple, which is more of a crossroads community. So it is a little different. Um, the balance of Deerfield uh, was really developed in a campus style uh, architecture, which is buildings just plopped in, 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 a, in, a, in a lot. And, uh, and according to the economic report, you'll see that that type of development is no longer really advantageous. And honestly, whatever we have, we have. The rest of it um, is being developed, I'll show you tonight, in the patterns that we're looking for that sort of align with the economic study. And all of this stuff has been done over the years and is in the planning stages, in the development stages. And it's kind of nice to see the economic study actually reinforce our, our levels and, and um, patterns of development. Uh, the, 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 the drawing on the left is showing that later staff came back and then completed the development pattern. And these are all through the form-based code um, ordinances um, through the, um, the Bethany area, which is coming up um, all the way to Forsyth County. Next slide. Okay, so starting from the top, I'm just going to give you a little history of some of the things that we've hit, some of the stumbling blocks and, and things that we're looking at, so you can think of it as food for thought uh, change. Again, we're not changing radical, but we are polishing and cleaning it up. So this is starting from the sort of the north. We come down as a 6.8 acre lot uh, along Highway 9, and uh, it's been undeveloped for a little while. I call it the apple orchards. It used to be apple orchards. Uh, and... Um, We've had several people come in and look at this lot, and um, they all wanted, of course, put residential on it, and uh, the, the way the ordinances are written and the way the council has directed staff is they really don't want residential along Highway 9. It's, it's commercial only, so we, they, we have no residential component unless it's vertically integrated mixed use, and I will show you later. We're getting a whole lot of that in, so I don't know if there's a strong need to change anything here, but one of the options that uh, the developers did come in with was said, gee, Bob, can we have maybe the first, this is about a 500 foot um, deep lot. They said, maybe can we make the first 100, 120 feet um, commercial and then residential in the back? So that's just something for you all to think about as, as a potential option on um, land use. Next slide. Uh, this here is, um, uh, everybody's talking about parks and things. And of course, on this side of town, you know, land use um, is a little difficult to put in parks because the land values are so high. So um, the city has, through its bond uh, referendum, uh, went out and purchased a whole bunch of uh, green space. And some of that is in this area, and that's along Webb Road. And then there's some areas that is actually owned by the, uh, the various HOAs. And then it comes up, and we did have some public input at the last meeting, uh, some folks that own the, the property along Cogburn Road, which is on the upper left of that dotted, dotted section, and uh, said, geez, can we increase our density because some of the surrounding neighborhoods have higher density. And, uh, but I, I really want you all to look at it because I think this is a potential area for some nice park and green space in this area uh, to be open and passive. Um, and then later I'll explain to you other potential uses for those properties that would not require any change to the zoning or land use. Next slide. All right, along uh, the Bethany Bend, when we did the form-based code, I believe in along Bethany Bend, there were four lots that were excluded from the form-based code um, ordinance. And so I wanted you all to know that those exist some of them have come in for rezonings and um, the council has actually denied those. Uh, so most of them are set for medium density, three units per acre currently. And um, I guess I'm bringing them up because I'd like the committee to look at it, potentially make a recommendation to incorporate those lots, they're sort of outlining lots into the form base code so that we can now further um, um, oversee and, and control the architectural character and uh, the various other components that the form-based code requires uh, within those lots. I think the rezonings have been rejected by council and I think they need to be incorporated in form-based code so that we can then uh, apply those, um, those regulations and applications uh, to them. Next. Okay, so I just wanted to, oh, next one. 
And I just wanted to show you some of the projects that are ongoing. I can't go over all the projects in this given time, uh, but there's a lot of projects that are going on in this corridor. And uh, quite frankly, I think once the corridor, the actual corridor of uh, Highway 9 gets redeveloped, which is all in the planning stages and in the very near future, we're not looking at 20 years to rebuild Highway 9. Highway 9 is scheduled to be redone. They're doing land acquisition now, and uh, it's moving along quite nicely uh, through GDOT. And we've been monitoring that as staff. Uh, once they do that, the demand on Highway 9 is going to be just exponential because the whole corridor will just have a better look and feel from a walkability, from landscaping, from crosswalks, from time lights that are much more in sync. Um, all of that, a better traffic flow, reduced speeds, everything will just give it a much more um, level of inducement to start building. But even the way it sits now, a lot of people are projecting that development to occur along the corridor, the roadway improvement, and they're already starting to come in. Now, these are just some of the ones we had. This was Pike Nursery. They came in just to show you they took up the whole depth of the lot. Uh, we are showing some future right of way. We're going to clean up that intersection at the Bethany Bend uh, intersection, which is kind of a, just a crazy intersection. It's already been redesigned and it's all being planned in. So I wanted to show you the right side is the development. The left side is showing you the overall and how it looks and how it's going to get cleaned up. So uh, I think some, you know, road improvements really do help on the development side. Uh, we're gonna be expanding Morris Road. Uh, there's a new interchange coming in on 400. All of these things become very dynamic and really will change the way the land uh, use and the demand for the land and the value of the land will start to, uh, to unfold. Next one. Again, this is just a larger um, zoomed out shot. Um, you can see on the lower, Right on the left side, the, the two white buildings, that's our new public safety complex that just opened. Um, and I think that's gonna be a strong anchor uh, civic presence um, on this side of town, very important. Um, the, other, the other items are just showing where the pike is in relationship. And we got like the public shopping center and those folks, uh, they're all owned by REITs, but those folks are coming in saying, gee, Bob, what do we need to do to redevelop those and, and revitalize those, uh, those shopping centers because they have a lifetime uh, span, maybe 10, 15 years, and then they start, to, uh, they start to, to feather out. According to the economic study you heard tonight, those anchor type of developments, which is what that is, are starting to diminish and, um, and dissolve. So now these folks are coming in saying, listen, we're not getting the demand that we want. We need to start redevelopment. Well, the form-based code allows exactly for that type of development. And let's go to the next one. You got it? No, nope. the other way. One more. One more. Okay, so now we're starting to see some of the developments. I just I want everybody to know that these developments are in and uh, we are reviewing them they're, So they're currently in the planning stage. So when somebody, a developer comes in and says, Bob, I wanna start developing some big large tracts of land in the Deerfield area. It's not something that just happens overnight. It, they come in, it has to take time. We have to look through the whole thing. We need the LDP study. By the time they do an economic analysis, we get financing, the banks, I'm working with banks every single day. And I will tell you, they love working with Milton. Um, they, they, they find the level of security with them. But again, but, and then by the time we get the tenants and we stop building and, and uh, the developers looked at me now and said, Bob, for the first time, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna pre-lease. Normally we build and then they come. But now the demand is so great to be in Milton in that type of environment. So on this one, this is a form-based code product. It's gonna have roads through it. They're also, because the land values are so high, they're, they're proposing to have uh, structured parking. And actually, uh, the, if you read the details of the economic study, they will tell you that they encourage the cities to go ahead and build the structured parking lots like Alpharetta did. And they actually had to pay for them and they have to maintain them. And I will tell you that I've been working with the development community and I'm getting them to put in the structured parking so that we could hide it behind the retail so you don't even see it. Unlike Alpharetta, that's exposed. 
And we as a city and taxpayers don't have to maintain it. We don't have to build it. Okay, let the developers do it. So there it is. There's a nice parking structure. It's all encased in buildings. You won't even see it from the road. This development happens to still have a 75 foot buffer, even though it's in form based code, has a 75 foot buffer all around it. So the two residential communities, Avonson and Fairmont, um, are protected. And it's still uh, uh, very desired and working. And, and I think we're on our way to get this developed. So that's one mixed use uh, community that's um, being. Um, proposed and developed. This one here is the, I call it the Target Shopping Center. It's between Target and Kohl's. And it, there is an existing shopping center there now, and it's a revitalization of that. Um, it, it was more of a campus style. That was where you pull up, you go, you get out of your car, you shop in the store, you get back in your car and you leave. Uh, those are again, a economic study will tell you that that's not working anymore. So now what's happening? Well, the form-based code is gonna cover all of this. It's exactly what it is. I can almost tell you it looks like a mini Avalon. It's gonna have roads and, and structured roads through it. We have a central town square or park. We have a movie theater. We have a boutique hotel interested in coming in. We have mixed vertically integrated mixed use buildings, which are in the middle. There's three of those. We have retail along highway nine and retail along the back with two structured parking garages on either side. You can see them on either side of the movie theater on the bottom in the middle. And, um, and so that, that whole development is, is in for planning, in coming in, we're working with the developer, we're working with tenants and we're working with the banks. It's, it's, it's a revitalization. So what happens there is we have to actually work with people to check a boredom and you know, not just to throw people out. They have leases, existing leases and things. Uh, but we are working with, and I think it has all the elements that the economic study will say or what we need to create. It's all there. Next. This one here is just on different housing types. So I just want, you know, on this side of town, the market says, well, you know, you have all this different housing types all in, in the AG1 area. Yes, all our houses are million dollar plus, and that's great. And what are we going to do? You know, are we really servicing our community? And are we being, you know, somewhat equitable? Are we getting everybody in? Well, these are duplexes. These are duplexes that are on Webb and Deerfield. Very uh, appropriate location for it. It's uh, across from Deerfield Green, which is all townhouses. We have townhouses here in Deerfield. We have apartments. We have single family. Avanzan has smaller scale footprints. Uh, I will show you some other single family detached that we're proposing and, and have been built. Um, but these are duplexes. And so there's two units per building. And um, and the form-based code uh, supported that. So I think it's nice. They all abut the street. We'll have a nice street inside. It's right across the street from Freedom Park, which is a little local uh, park that the city actually constructed and maintains. Next. All right, so, oh, I'm sorry. Um, that, so this here is uh, now getting away from the Highway 9 um, area. We're getting back into what traditionally was campus style. You can see in the middle of the page, the Verizon, uh, office complex is just just that it's campus style. They just kind of put them there with big sea of parking all around. But we have specific areas here that are people are coming in and are interested in development. We've had the Crescent property come in several times. They first came in and went in front of council with just housing. Council said no. We want vertically integrated mixed use product. And it was it was really great that the council's holding true to the vision and the master plan. And I commend the council for this because it's easy to give in and say, okay, fine, just do housing. They said, no, now they've come back and said, okay, we'll do horizontally integrated mixed use. We'll do commercial and then we'll do residential next to it. And again, we said, no, that doesn't work. Now they've come back in saying, okay, Bob, I guess you're right. You know, the market's strong and we need vertically integrated mixed use. The demand is so great. So if, if we just said, okay, let's just take the first thing that comes in, we're not getting really what the best product is from Milton. And it's the staff has that task of working with these people day after day and, and guiding them and, and kind of promoting the right type of development that we're looking for from Milton. And so let, we can keep going. Uh, this is Webb. So Webb is nice. It's a spine road that goes between Morris, Deerfield, and Cogburn. 
And this is very important because all of these connect, road connections have to be integrated in order for it to really become a walkable community. That's what everybody wants, right? Everybody says, do you feel this walkable? Well, it is. We've installed a lot of sidewalks. A Highway 9 corridor will get re rebuilt. A uh, long web road, we put in uh, sidewalks. We put in medians in the road. So th these landscape medians, um, it wasn't easy to get through public works, but I will tell you they're very successful. They've slowed down traffic. They've given you a place of refuge if you want to cross the street through a crosswalk. They've given you the, the, uh, the ability to put landscaping on the road. And, and, and I will show some of the pictures that you will see, uh, like the one on the left, you'll see it, it sort of starts to enhance the character. So all of a sudden we have a much nicer uh, visual between road and building. You can't just think of things as road. You have to think of this holistically. Um, on the other side, I did want to show you just some of the architecture. This is, uh, um, um, it was a um, cube smart self storage and they came in and you know, the form based code says, look, we don't really care what type of use you're going to put in. The architecture has to look like it belongs in Milton. When you drive by, you don't want, so on the left is what they came in with. They came in with something that just looks like a typical 106 building, you know, cube smart, and they're just going to build a uh, four walls, concrete block, and it's going to look real cold and hard. And it almost looks like it could be anywhere. And what we did was we sat down with the developer and said, nope, this is in the form-based code. We want it to have a nice character. It's next to Brickmont, which is assisted living. And they put a whole lot of time and energy into theirs. And we wanted it to be complementary along this corridor. And that's what we ended up working and, and, and designing and building. Now, this developer looked at me and said, Bob, I spent millions of dollars more than we projected. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that back. And, and I sat with them and we went through the whole market analysis and I did his business plan. And guess what? While he was building it, he called me up and said, I'm already 100% occupied. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, this, this is the kind of thing. Now, once that's the, that type of atmosphere starts to spread, other developers hear it, other builders hear it, other community members hear it. And that's why I don't want to change things too radically because this way it all comes in. Let's go next one. This is, okay, now we're gonna start looking at Kensley, which is a single family detached. It is a vertical three-story product. And I know somebody brought up the fact that, you know, we have elderly and uh, our aging population, but 80% of the houses in Kensley have elevators. We put them all in. They initially thought that they were gonna sell them for 460,000. Guess what? 680 to 720. Everybody loves being in there. And most of the aging population, they'll sell something and they sell something at a very high price, but they just don't want to take care of 20 acres anymore. But they still want to be in a highly, you know, a highly designed type of environment. And they're willing to spend that kind of money. They just don't want to take care of the land anymore. So they're almost scared to go into something that's like $100,000 because they just say that's not the type of environment. We still want to stay in Milton and we're still willing to pay for it but we just don't want to take care of the land. And this is what we're getting in these areas. And so this design here is showing that the detention pond that in front um, um, the roadway, okay, web, is it, we, we looked at it and said, look, let's make it into a pocket park. Let's design it as a pocket park. Let's, let's go ahead, instead of just having a detention pond, let's make it into a nice park. And so guess what? The developer ended up, you know, we worked with them and told them how to do it. And the developer put it in. It helped them on his sales. They all doubled in value. And now the public gets to use it and it's starting to develop and the trees are starting to mature. And I think it's coming out very nice. So it's a, it's a way to get those pocket parks in without the city always having to pay for them. I mean, the whole idea to stay vibrant as a city is to make sure financially we stay sound. And the more we sit there and say, okay, we're just going to keep spending, keep spending, keep spending, all of a sudden we don't become, you know, when our bond rating starts to drop and all of a sudden our debt structure starts going up. So what we're trying to do is get the, the, the development community and the individuals to do it so that we can get and achieve the result that you want, but have it done privately. Next slide. This one is another revitalized uh, shopping center along Highway 9. Um, it's the Watercrest. Uh, this is Tony's. He came in and, and first we dressed up the existing building. 
that's the little building up on the top where the star is. It's the one below it. It's linear, it's going uh, left to right. We revitalized it. He got 100% occupancy in there, 100%. He told me he never, never has been at 100%. He was hesitant to re revitalize that existing building, and we did it very cost effectively, and he's now at 100%. The demand for retail is strong, and I'll tell you why, because he showed everybody what he was going to do under the form-based code next to it, which is where the star is. It's a two-story retail uh, complex with outdoor patios and outdoor space, and everybody all of a sudden says, wow, we want to be in there. Okay, next. This is just an example of a, a, a half acre lot along Highway 9 where they came in and said, we do want to do retail on the ground floor and residential above. Um, and it's a smaller lot, it's independent, it's standing on its own. So I just wanted to show you some of the options that, are, that have been coming in and people are looking to do. Next. Uh, and this is just some of the roadways. So the picture on the right is showing a web with the median how it looks, the landscaping, and this is the, the envisionment of some of Highway 9, how that's gonna look, integrating the, the new commercial and the new developments, these new mixed use developments with the landscape along the roadway, the median will be there. Uh, you can see the middle picture is the absence of all of this. And it's, it is somewhat of a suburban kind of a blight. So, and then of course the, the left side is the same thing. All right, we can do next slide. Okay, so some of the uh, potential action items I wanted you to think about is, you know, we are doing a lot of enhancing of the architecture in this, in this area. We are focusing on walkability and the connection to the Greenway. There was a presentation Monday night to council on Morris and how uh, Public Works is working very diligently to make the connection to the Greenway, uh, both Alpharetta and Forsyth Greenways. So I think that will be the missing link and I think that's gonna be great. Uh, some of the thoughts of the transition from the commercial to residential, like on the Apple Orchard, if you're interested in that, that would be maybe 100, 120 feet of commercial. Um, could be another option for the committee to think about. Uh, high quality public spaces, I think we're hitting. Public parks with the detention area, I think we're hitting on. Structured building, indoor. So now with parks, you, in an area that's really expensive, land values are high, you're not going to get a big passive park. I mean, the, the, the city would have to go out and buy 60 acres. Where are you going to get 60 acres in Deerfield? So what I'm thinking is there's different types of parks. I mean, we can have parks that are buildings where you have indoor gymnasiums, indoor physical fitness, um, you know, community center rooms, things that people would want to use, seniors would want to use. Uh, I'm not really a senior yet, but we do it all the time. We go out and we want to have indoor space. We want to have programmed activities. We want to go and play some gym, especially now in the cold. We go in and we can get to walk around and get some exercise. So just different options. Don't think of just passive and active parks being these big open vast parks. They could be park buildings that service the community in other ways. And if you want a big active park, yes, maybe on web, Along that, where I showed you initially, we could get one in, but we could also get other types of park structures in. Um, branding, branding, of course, we have to include. Uh, we do need to do branding. I will tell you that's one thing that I'm challenged with. I do want, uh, we've been doing a lot and we've been getting the economic team, we're getting the buildings in, we've been doing the code, we've been doing everything. Now we got a brand. And I will tell you that that's a big charge for us. We, we do need to get, and council has given staff um, some, some ability to do that financially um, over a five year period. They've given us some help there and we will be taking advantage of that. But I would really like the branding to come out of this committee. The type of branding, what kind of branding, what, what is our brand? What are we really looking for? I mean, we're doing all the development and everything, but what is the essence uh, somebody mentioned, what kind of people are we looking to attract? All of these items that you guys have been talking about is awesome. I think if you could kind of give me some direction and help and, um, and we, something we can, you know, be charged with, I think that would really be advantageous out of this. Um, very, a variety of housing styles. I think we have a lot. Redevelopment of existing and all the retail establishments I think we've been doing. And potential addition of the Bethany Bend is four lots. If you make a recommendation to bring those into form-based code, 
I think that would really help us out as staff to not only get them developed, but to get them developed correctly. Um, hey, Bob, we're going to jump right into the next one. I Bob, think, can I interrupt for a minute? It, no? yes. So just in case any of you um, didn't realize, Bob's really passionate about his job. I'm and, sorry. <laughs> and, and, sorry. We, and we added 30 minutes to our agenda because we knew we were going to have him speaking. <laughs> Am I okay? Uh, but you're still over time. I'm still over time. Uh, I did Jeez. want to put a bow on this. You know, there was discussion earlier and there's um, discussion even through the survey responses about whether or not further study of the Deerfield area was warranted as a character area. What I'm reading here is not a full study. You're looking just to do some minor tweaks because mm -hmm. a lot of stuff is in motion behind the scenes. That's is that correct? correct? I, would, I would say that's correct. Does, does this committee, and I just, so I'm gonna to try to divide the public comment or our comments on this. Does this committee see what Bob's trying to highlight as being tweaks versus major overhaul for the Deerfield area? Now that you have a better understanding of some of the development activities that are already in formation because of the form-based code. Are you, are you comfortable with it not being a rewrite of the character area? Personally, I'm comfortable with that, but maybe a little bit of further explanation of form-based code and how it operates would be helpful. Oh, that's the next to be right that now. On but the agenda for next time to talk yeah. about form-based. Maybe code. we'll do that. I'll do a whole over overview of that's, what form-based code is system. and how it works and how it integrates and how it addresses all the and, and complements all the economic uh, study and and the demand that's out there. And w this is all stuff that's been in place for uh, several years now. So it's, it's kind of like we had forward thinking to kind of put that in place. A lot of cities are trying to run after it now that they know that that's where the economy is going and the demand is, they're all trying to catch up. Uh, we're already in place. Uh, you do you I, want to I would just make two comments yes. since um, this is an area I've been involved in for a long time. Um, Cause I actually was part of the group that did the overlay a long time ago before we became a city. Um, I agree with Bob. Um, I think what's happening should form the vision, but I still think the older stuff that will eventually turn over um, needs that vision as well. So it needs to be, what is the comprehensive look as all these properties start turning over? What does that look like? And I would add to that, um, we really need a connection between the Forsyth County line uh, sidewalks uh, down to Bethany Bend. It's Crooked Creek, a run walk, and it is so dangerous. It's terrible. We, nobody can walk because there is no sidewalk. Will that be happening from oh, the GDOT? Okay. Will work? be happening from the mm -hmm. GDOT, and we'll be making sure that that connection's in there. And uh, I know Rick, my uh, council member, brought up a lot of great criteria at Monday night's meeting saying, you know, I want crosswalks and I want landscaping. And you know, it was just great co comment. I, I don't know if everybody knows Laura Weissong. She's worked with me. She's the chair of our DRB. And I've worked with Laura for probably 10 years. Uh, and so every piece of architecture uh, other than single family detached homes actually goes in front of the DRB. And Laura heads that up and we really work together to create that vision. So when she talks about a consistent vision along the corridor, um, I'm, I'm in sync with her because we are trying to create that kind of consistent vision. And that's why I was asking everybody if you'd work with me a little bit on suggestions for branding and what you think and what's, what kind of brand should we look at and you know ideas that we, we can kind of push out there. Or just if you just say, Bob, we're going to you know, put in the work plan that we need branding staff will certainly be studying it and then uh, bringing it back. I just have a quick comment. Um, uh, one of the, the issues as a council member that I struggle with is that we have so few commercial areas. And then I hear that it's important now with mixed uses that we have a residential component. So I would really like to understand from CPAC, you know, how we hit that sweet spot, because once our commercial corridor or space is gone, it's gone. That, that's for us who live here. We, we, we give it to new residents. 
And so I really, I, I struggle with what is the right answer. And I would love for you all to. Um, I was I was happy to put the ban on, but then I hear from very seasoned professionals that residential has to be part of the mixed use. So that's just something I would like to, to have a, a, a discussion with this group. I think that might be helpful. And then also I love the idea of a park area on the Cogburn corridor. It just seems ripe for that with all the schools there and the goat pass on the side of the road just Know, people are so ready to walk more in that area. And I think if we can connect them, the, everyone will walk to these areas. So thank you. I echo them. I have a question just on the, the, the whole Deerfield thing and on Highway 9. As you go north of Bethany Bend, the apple orchards, right, all that, we live just north of that, across from Crooked Creek in one of the small neighborhoods right across Milton Preserve. But that stretch from basically that apple orchard north to the county line, is that considered a commercial corridor first? Or it just is a mix hodgepodge with, you know, that golf country club thing, the the liquor store, 17 animal hospitals and car lots, you know, even okay. inside of Milton, right? Not that many, but how is that classified or planned for, uh, with, with your it, vision? It, it is the, the way the master plan, the ordinance is written, it is a commercial corridor. However, the areas that are around the five acre um, um, subdivision, there's several lots there that when we did the, the development of the ordinance, uh, we worked very closely with those community members to uh, get the type of development that they're looking for architecturally, even though it is a retail office type of development. That, that, that the architectural character along those areas will be much more in a residential look. So even though it's going to a commercial, it won't have that hard commercial look. It will be much more of a residential style, almost like downtown Crabapple. And one last question on the roads, on Highway 9 itself, I know the GDOT thing I was, was involved with some of that early on, like two, three years ago, whenever it was, but is that considered to be kind of two lanes each direction with sort of a mixed middle kind of for turning or is it going to go three lanes? Because with all this development, like what you're doing at where the Coles is just north of that, that seems really cool and everything. That's going to add more and more traffic, right? And the corridor is going to become even more of a corridor commercially. So are we really planning for that with, because it seems like a lot of development by GDOT and in other states I've lived in, they just catch up and it's already behind. You know, it will be a four lane road with a median and there's been a lot of uh, design um, criteria incorporated in, even into, you know, how to turn around and uh, not to have a lot of breaks in the median and left turns and so that we keep traffic moving, but at a slower pace, the volume would be the same and it would still have a nice um, um, a character to it, a much softer character to it while still moving the same traffic. But you, you can look at that online. I mean, it's all posted. So should we start on the next one? Well, hang on. I wanted to bring that for discussion. So we can continue to flush out, um, and we are over schedule, some of the discussion and clarity on the Deerfield area and move the AG1 to another session. Um, or we're going to probably end up going over a good half hour plus to nine o'clock. What's the temperature of the group? Oh. Is that is that the general temperature to continue applying for to get through the AG1? I don't want to short short circuit anyone's input. I'll try to get through it as quick as I can. No, I don't want I don't want to do that either. I think it's important. So <laughs> if we're good to go forward, then we'll continue. Just understand we're probably going to be 15 to 30 minutes over because of Bob time. All right. <laughs> And I take full responsibility for this. I, you All right. Okay, Keep rolling. Let's, get, let's get on the next one, please. Sorry, Bob, the Bob. I'm too passionate about it, I know. Okay. All right, let's get on to the next one. Okay, so the AG1 focus area, uh, let's get on. So the majority of our, of our land as a mass is in the AG1. Right now, the focus areas say that we have a Birmingham and a central Milton, that's the upper purple in the middle. Um, but from a code perspective, really the code, the rural Milton overlay, 
really addresses the, and the, that whole area, both Birmingham and Central Mountain as a whole. Uh, but I will tell everybody in the room that architecturally, when I'm reviewing things, I do treat the development in the purple area a little different architecturally. It's much more rural. And that's where you have like the Birmingham Crossroads. And of course that has its own overlay and its own requirements. And it is being developed out. As you can see, if you go up there, they are developing it. We just approved some of the commercial buildings along Birmingham uh, Highway. And, they, and I assure everybody that they'll have that kind of character. So let's go to the next one. Now, this slide, if I could just spend the most amount of time on this slide, because no, it really tells the story. It tells the story of why Milton is Milton, why Milton is so great. It's just the way it happens to develop. When cities form, they become like concentric rings. You have the urban, then you get suburban, and then you get rural. And it's almost in a ring fashion. And if you look at all, all the cities, that's how they develop, most of these areas. But when you look at Milton per se, the, the dark areas are showing you all the subdivisions and all the lighter areas are in between. It's almost like just dotted. And so when you drive through Milton, you don't really drive through all like suburbia and then get into a rural zone. You're just kind of driving through, seeing a subdivision, then you see a large lot or a farm. Subdivision, large lot of farm. So your eye is constantly being broken and you say, wow, this is just a great, great experience to be. And, and this map shows how that, how that experience is being, uh, is being shown right in here. And, so now the question comes up, you say, well, Bob, that's great. And this looks wonderful, but how do we preserve this? How do we, that's why Milton's so great because you can go through and see some subdivisions and then see some open space and farms and horses and, and it kind of breaks your eye, right? So how do we preserve this? Well, the, the council's already said, the way we preserve this uh, is to incentivize large lot subdivisions maintain horse farms. So that's what we've been doing. And honestly, it's been a very, it's all developed. The, the, the ordinance passed, we worked through council. They did a great job with it. We put incentives, but it's all on an election, elective basis. In other words, we, we're not forcing anybody to do it because underlyingly it'd be a taking if we just told everybody now you have to go to three acre loans. But if we incentivized it, now everybody can go into three acre lots and feel like they're, from an economic standpoint, the, the initial development cost is sold much lower that it's advantageous. And that's what we're doing. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, of course we have one acre zoning on paved roads, three acre zoning on gravel roads. We've implemented a rural view shed, which means when you drive down a road, if you have a subdivision, the first 60 feet has to stay um, untouched and, and uh, so that the, these, these um, developments that are coming in, these subdivisions, uh, as from, from a roadway perspective, you know, they don't look, when you drive by, you no longer see a, a, a subdivision. You see the original pattern, which is mostly landscaping. And everything that's, uh, every building along the, any city owned street is subject to architectural review. And I will assure everybody in the room that that's um, a necessary evil because some of the things that come in, you would not believe. So uh, we've been maintaining the architectural character in Milton. Um, encouraging large lots, of course, we have a, a whole ordinance now that encourages it. But I wanted, there's two things that I just have been coming up um, and I wanted to make this uh, committee aware of it because I'd like you to address it. Um, one is, the minimum lot frontage of lots, I would, I would like to see uh, potentially go from maybe 100 to 150 feet because 100 feet is just not wide enough. And when we get 100 foot wide lots, they end up building the building and then coming in for variances. And Todd will attest that we just get tons Amen, and tons absolutely. of variances. And it's really because the developer knew that you couldn't fit everything in, but the code says 100, so we put 100. And we got the house in, but nothing else. And everybody in Milton wants a pool. They want a, a pool house. They want a sports court. They want a cabana. And by the time, and then they, they're in line on variances trying to get relief because the lots are just too narrow. So that's one. The next one would be uh, flag lots. So uh, um, I'd like to, let's go to the next slide so I can please. So uh, this is a typical lot. It's showing a five acre lot. There's one house on it you can see, and there's a road and it comes in, next slide. Yep. 
So this one, this is a typical flag lot. So this, this five acre landowner comes in and says, you know what, Bob? I, I want to do a flag lot. And the flag lot says you only need 35 feet of flood frontage. And then you, they can sneak in three, three dwelling units. So now I have a five acre lot that's got three houses on it. Where if we didn't have flag lots, you'd maintain the five acre lot. You'd maintain the picture I showed you in the beginning. Where we are right now, you would maintain that because you'd be saying, look, we're not gonna let this kind of density come in. So it, it's just something to think about, something to look at, something if you want, and if you have interest in, we can vet that. Can and, you speak to what other jurisdictions around us, yeah. what so their policies let's are? Let's look at that. So I did do some study. I said, well, you know, what are other jurisdictions doing? I mean, is it something that we can just kind of propose as a committee? And we found that Alpharetta, um, deleted it as a requirement, I think in 2001. Robin did all my research on this, so I appreciate it. Um, Sandy Springs, none. Yep, and Roswell, same time. So all our sister cities, if I could say sister cities around us, have already eliminated it from a, as, as far as a uh, um, development option. And I think we need to look at it as a, 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 um, a CPAC committee to say, you know, do we want to try to maintain uh, the larger style lots? Uh, we have incentives on the bigger tracks, but on the smaller tracks, the demand is great, the price is high, and people are coming in. Let's go to the next one. I have to maintain speed here. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, a thought on those flag lots. Um, as you described them, higher density, mm -hmm. and they uh, impact our rural, rural view shift. They do. Um, earlier, we saw the survey results for gravitating toward development. It seems like they're in, definitely in conflict with what. Um, now that it's on the page, everyone sees it. Um, we're going to be deliberating until October. And during this period of time, I think a lot of developers are going to go out and rezone a lot of these properties. Why? I, I like to suggest that the, the, the CPAC consider um, suggesting a or recommending a moratorium on flag lots so that we can stop this and then we can deliberate ourselves and make a judgment about what direction is best for Milton. Okay. It's, um, and this came up earlier, I commented on this as well. Managed growth was a big theme in whatever form of input that we've got. And then I think we've all just generally expressed concerns on that. Is, th is this notion of a moratorium um, to get ahead of things, to give us time to study it and, and signal to the marketplace. Like we've also signaled a moratorium for Highway 9 on residential. There's a moratorium on residential. Should we do something similar for something like this? And can that message be delivered to city council prior to the conclusion of this? I think we have a briefing next month actually with city council. Is that something that we would want Bob, as an example, to take the city council as a consideration? I know I would. Do we, is that some, do I need to take that a vote to make this, or is anyone in opposition of this being taken forward? Because uh, I'd like to get both perspectives if there are. I think, Bob, you've heard the charge to um, take this forward to city council next month as a mechanism to get ahead of what could be a rush. Okay. Thank, Ron, right. thank you for bringing that up. Thanks. Man. All right, next slide. What happened to my slide? You got to deduct that time from my thing. You know, <laughs> from your overage? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to hear it. Bob, you ran over. Bob, there you, you ran go. over. Awesome. Uh, we've practiced 100 times. I'm not supposed to run over. I got okay. you 20 seconds. Go. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so this is just, uh, I wanted everybody, there's been conversation about maintaining our senior or elderly or our aging population. And the city of Milton is very sensitive to this. And we've 
went ahead, and this is one of our, uh, the probably the oldest building in North Fulton, and it's mid 1800s. Um, uh, I always referred to as the Hopewell House. It, it was rebranded as the Thomas Bird House. Um, but it, it's a real historic structure. And what we did was the city went out and purchased it and uh, then um, went ahead and put um, North Fulton Senior Services as a use into it. Uh, so they're using it. I used to be on the board of directors uh, for North Fulton Senior Services. I got very involved in senior services and, the, and the, the theory, and there's a lot of work and effort that goes into that and trying to maintain our, um, our aging population to maintain um, location in Milton so that they're next to their children. Um, other things that are happening though in these areas is um, people with large lots, and I'll show you as we progress that they, they also wanna have um, um, additional uh, accessory structures guest on their houses. property, guest houses and things. And that's another way to maintain and address the aging population. But we also did a, um, uh, signage and historic structure, and we had a historic board, and they went ahead and put all of the uh, historic markers around Milton. So I think we're we're trying to address the historical character, maintain it, and highlight it. Next slide. Okay, so these are just some of the land uses. I mean, you're allowed to have you know your single family residential house in an AG one, but I wanted everybody to see this because there's other options in AG one that are out there. Uh, of course, the civic uses are fire stations and parks, and everybody knows that we're doing those. Um, by right, you could do a winery, you could do vet clinic or kennel, and, and of course, equestrian. I highlighted the vet clinic and the kennel. We've gotten two new vet clinics. Uh, I think the architectural character of them is, is really blending in with Milton, but they are small animal vet clinics, and I'd love the the committee to look at how to incentivize a large animal vet clinic like for horses and things like that. Uh, kennels have also come up. So there are existing kennels in the city of Milton and, and sometimes, you know, people are buying them and then the intensity of the use increases and then the, the surrounding communities start to say, hey, you know, this is not advantageous and we get a lot of feedback there. So what I would like to do is have this committee look at kennels and the regulations of kennels, which we can go over in future meetings, or work sessions, uh, educational sessions, and where we could sit down and say, it, you know, do they need further setbacks? Do, do they need to be limited in the number of animals? Um, all sorts of things that we'll go over. But I think they need to be addressed because we do get a lot of kickback from the community on that. Um, other uses that are permitted by uh, use permit, that means that you have to go in front of council in order to uh, get some conditions and oversight by the council. Uh, on how to do that. That would be a landscape business, a rural event facility, which we have several of, um, a bed and breakfast. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of those, but as people have mentioned it, and I think it's a great use, and I'd like to encourage it more when people come in. Uh, alternative senior housing is another big one. Um, uh, th this is when you have like a house and you have maybe four or five seniors living in it, right, Robin? Versus... Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, religious institutions and private schools. I put those in red because <laughs> Robin's told me since she's been here, uh, we haven't had any. They, and when they come in and people propose them, uh, the community outcry is so great that most of the developers of those just say, you know what, there's way too much opposition here from the community. We're, we're not going anywhere. We're walking away on them. And um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. There's traffic flow and, and um, intensity of the use. And, and so I just put them in red because I think that this committee should look at those and say, okay, do we, maybe we okay with religious institutions being put in, but maybe we limit the square footage of the institution. Maybe we limit how many cars they could put. Maybe they don't have daycare and schools is included into the institution. I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, you can have all of these and we have a lot of them existing and they're here, but somehow or another when new ones come in and they sit right in the middle of new communities and there's a lot of public outcry. So, so the I just issue think is, we is, can address is, those. Yeah, more specifically that these type of uses within an, an AG1 environment, which is largely residential, tend to be in conflict, tend to be and They do, and I, I think we need to just have better regulation on them. 
Maybe we need to limit size, square footage, occupancy, all sorts of things. We can look at those. Um, okay. I just want everybody. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think what Bob is saying, and I don't want to confuse things, a brand new facility. Right. Um, there has not been any approved uh, brand new ones since the incorporation of the city in 14 years. So, and, and I just want to add that on the one property that we did have, Freemanville and Red, it's come full, full circle. So we've gone back to large, large lots on that. It, again, if we just wait for the, the correct and proper Milton right. use, we usually get to it if we we get to where we need to be. I work with that uh, landowner, and we actually encouraged the large lots and got them. Uh, the the church on Ebenezer expansion, we work with them very closely. Redesigned it three times, got it perfect, and now the congregation's very happy with it, and they're really excited, and, and they're going to go and they're going to start to build it. Tree canopy ordinance. I just want you to know that we did uh, pass this. We did give an incentive to larger lots as well. So that's one of our incentives. Next. Uh, the green space bond, everybody's aware of. I just wanted to show you the slide because I think the committee, the MDEC committee did a really great job on this. They, they, they kind of spread out throughout the city uh, the purchase of this green space. So I think it was evenly distributed uh, around the city. And, and of course, it's just as properties come up and it's not easy uh, to, to achieve this result. I think they worked very hard on it. Uh, over over the years, so it looks really good. Next, uh, this one here again, you could start to see that pattern and how it's spread out. But I wanted to show you that even the larger Milton horse farms are spread out as well. It's not like they're all up in that one area and 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 the other areas are all dense. We, the beauty of Milton is that we spread them out, and they, they have been that way. And it's it's I'd like to keep that um, these these farms vibrant and thriving. So completed items, let's go through these. We have uh, large lot incentives, we've done. Detention pond design, we've done. Uh, the elimination of sidewalk requirements, um, accepting of schools and active parks. So this is, when you develop a new subdivision, you, and you'll see if you drive through Milton, some of them, there's sidewalks to nowhere. The sidewalks come out, just kind of come over and end. They'll never be connected to anything. So what we did was we said, no, we want a more rural look. The council's approved a lot of um, new changes to the code that now require the subdivision entrance to be much more rural in character, the signage, the fencing. You don't see those big stone walls anymore. You don't see these huge signs. Everything is scaled down. So everything we're doing in the AG1 area is kind of reinforcing that, that Milton rural look. The Royal View Shed, the 60 feet, maintaining it. Historical markers, we did. Tiered landscape design, um, this was a great idea. I mean, uh, th this was just a wonderful idea. Uh, Steve, our city manager, looked at me one day and said, Bob, um, the design of the landscape and the roundabouts, if they're more urbanized areas, they should have a different landscape visual than they do in the rural area. Uh, I, honestly, I thought that was genius. I mean, it. When you drive through, even though there's roundabouts and you're seeing them, you should feel like you're getting into a more rural character as you uh, get further away from the urbanized areas. Um, so I thought that was that was awesome. Um, road guardrail design. Uh, if you notice, we're trying to put more wood guardrails on lower speed roads and on the higher speed roads. When we do guardrails, we're trying to paint them uh, to make them blend in more rather than just seeing that that bright galvanized silver. Uh, that, that really kind of makes it look very cheetah. Um, the trail plan we passed and, um, and, and, and the council passed it. So we're looking to um, uh, continue that trail plan now and develop committee and, and whatnot on that. The tree canopy uh, conservation, I told you is passed and it's good. The impact fees, we did pass impact fees and most of that impact fee money, that's all Michelle worked on all our impact fees. Tremendous amount of work. Thanks, Michelle. Um, but most of that money is geared towards uh, the parks. So when we collect impact, every time they build a new house, right? Uh, how much is it? like seven thousand something dollars? Almost eight. So every time they build a new house, eight thousand dollars goes into this fund, which most of it goes to parks. So then we can now fund our parks again. The developers are going to pay 
to fund our parks because the city doesn't want to go out and just do it on its own. Um, we, we, a lot of it we do, but I'm just saying it helps. Um, uh, park master plan has been passed, architectural design compliance. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, good, I'm going to get two minutes. Um, incentives for hobby farms. I would like the committee to think about that. Tax incentives. Now, this is not something that we, we have control over with land use in itself, but it is, there's a coover that the county does on 10 acres plus. Maybe we can go down and lobby the county and say, can we do some tax incentive for smaller lots? Three acres, as long as they're true hobby farms. Maybe we need to help out the smaller farm. And that's really important. Um, signage, branding, and marketing, of course, is critical. And I, I've asked this count, uh, committee for help on that. Placement of accessory structures, that's critical too. If you have a, a horse farm, the code doesn't allow you to put an accessory structure like a little um, run-in or something uh, uh, you know, with, within uh, 60 feet of the roadway. But when you drive around, some of these barns look great when they're right up against the roadway. I mean, those are the barns we like. You drive down the road, you see an old barn right up against the roadway, you think, wow, that's cool. And yet the code does not uh, in incentivize this. And we need to give relief to these, these small equestrian style um, um, farms. Uh, location of accessory dwelling units. A lot of people buy a large lot there's an existing house that abuts the road. They want to build a bigger house in the back, but they want to maintain for their aging folk, aging parents and aging family members. They want to maintain the building up in the front. Well, guess what? They can't do that because you can't have the accessory structure in front of the main dwelling. And it's something then that goes in front of Todd's group to try to get a variance. And so I'd like, maybe we could look at that. Um, um, okay, let's see. Um, Noise associated with uh, fireworks, I think, is another big topic that we should look at. Uh, eliminate a uh, elimination of flag lots, we mentioned. 100 to 150 feet, we mentioned. Uh, coordination with Fulton County Schools, uh, use of recreation fields. Uh, to continue that, I know with COVID, a lot of that stuff kind of got sidetracked a little bit. Uh, but I know the city has been working with uh, Fulton County on all these MOAs, MOUs, to... Um, to utilize some of their fields as well. Road speeds, uh, I think our uh, public safety folks are looking at road speeds and doing a study now, but uh, I wouldn't mind this committee reinforcing that. Uh, internet access on more rural areas, very expensive. And I think we need to look at that to maintain the larger lot, the cost of putting that in. Um, the Birmingham Park equestrian orientation, uh, I think is, in, is critical. We, we just need more trails more horse trails up in Birmingham Park. And it's not something that's a whole lot of money to do, but I think it, it's something we can look at and encourage. Um, and, and of course, better, better regulate the religious institutions and the private schools. And I'm one minute over. Oh, that's um, okay. yeah, for our complete agenda. Yeah. Yeah, complete agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's official there. Tom. But uh, <laughs> there's a lot of, of really valuable insights in, in your experience and of uh, staff's collective experience is something that this committee benefits from. So um, there's, I think, a discussion portion. We've discussed the Deerfield piece, so now we'll focus on what Bob just presented. You sit here, Bob, if you can, there may be questions regarding the AG1. Um, and specifically, if we could have that with some of the potential action items, that might prompt some of the discussion as well. Bob, thank you so much. I mean, gosh, you know, love, you know, your creativity, enthusiasm, and leadership and everything. Uh, two things. One, the night sky preservation. Is that covered in a separate ordinance? It actually is. We have a night sky uh, ordinance and it, it regulates um, lighting um, to a great degree. Uh, everything is full cutoff, intensity, illuminations, uh, uh, placement of lighting. I think it's pretty, pretty good. It's pretty comprehensive and it's been working well. I was a little surprised that you had different designs for different areas because of the size of Milton. Is there any value in having a consistent image all throughout? So if you're in Deerfield, you feel part of, of uh, 
building Arch experience. architectural you're talking about right yeah i, I would say all the architectures kind of got that bob factor you know it's milton-esque i keep it in the same zone <laughs> But I do think differently when it's up uh, in the Birmingham area. I'll have much more porches, more overhangs, maybe exposed rafter tails, things, elements that make the house just look a whole lot more rural. Um, but overall, the look and feel is always consistent to a Milton-esque style. Yeah, the Cube Smart is a good example of that, even in the Deerfield area. Are you going to con continue the signage that you've used in Crabapple throughout Milton? I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. The signage that you put, all the new signage that you have in Crabapple, is is that going to be throughout Milton, or are you going to do different? In different well, actually, we did that signage plan and put it together, the, the wayfinding signage that you're seeing, and we are uh, planning on expanding that. Uh, it's another thing that Michelle's going to be heading up. Uh, the next area, focus area, will be the Birmingham Corners. But that uh, is one of the action items there. that Bob is it recommending is this action. committee to bring forward, which is the signage, branding, sign toppers, to expand yeah. that throughout the, the city. Right now, it's it's slightly different colors, but same style, same look. Uh, but I do want this committee to weigh in on that just to see, because uh, we'll be heading that up now with Birmingham uh, Corners. Signage is very important, especially up in Birmingham Corners. I think uh, the committee... The commercial needs additional signage and it needs to be addressed holistically. Signage in downtown Crabapple, uh, we need to address. Um, it, it sort of in itself, I'll, it's very short, signage is really designed in a code to be applicable to a tenant, tenant type signage. But when you say what's the name in, of the whole development, what's, uh, where's, the, where's the downtown Crabapple sign that says downtown Crabapple? The code doesn't really address that. And right now I've been, one of my big initiatives is to try to um, get that initiative going and the development community is embracing it. And they're really stepping up saying, Bob, we're willing to pay for it. We'll actually buy it, install it and maintain it. And if you let us put it in, because they really want it. Uh, it was defined to us and Steve was in that meeting with me where the, the developer looked at Steve and I and said, we, we, we want people to come up and start doing selfies with their phones and have Crabapple in the background. And, um, and we, we've been really working on that initiative uh, wholeheartedly. And Steve's been really uh, supportive and working with me on that. And, and as we move further in the direction of this mixed use as a, as a uh, product, signage uh, is something to consider too. As you said, older products, the sign goes on the building and um, they may not be visible from the public street. So how do we help with, the, with signage in those sort of concepts that are, that are appealing to us as citizens and help us move through easier, but don't create an eyesore? I'll just tell you quick, when we did the, uh, the daycare center on Cogburn Road, um, the building came out great, uh, but then the sign code allowed them to put these really big signs up. Uh, we can't, we couldn't regulate that. Uh, so then all of a sudden it just, I think, detracted from the building. We did the cube smart, which I think the building looks great architecturally, but they just put up these signs because they wanted to do blade signs and they wouldn't be allowed. So we signage is, and branding, I think, is something big. And again, thank you for all you've done. But the question I have is, did anybody give any thought to like, you know, gateways when you're entering Milton, instead of the little green sign that says you're now in Milton City yes. and such and such sports team. We've addressed gateway signage. Uh, we did one iteration of gateways. Um, honestly, I think they're low impact. Uh, we did work on that. It wasn't easy because we had to try to get land in order to put it in. So it was a little difficult. Uh, putting stuff on roadways, then all of a sudden GDOT says, oh, you can't do that because, you know, somebody could run into it and all. Uh, we are working on another big initiative that Michelle will be taking on, which is doing the branding and the gateways, what we call gateway. And, and gateway signage can't just be like coming into Milton. I want everybody to think, like when you're driving through rural Milton, say an AG1 area, maybe we should stop branding something like, hey, this is an equestrian zone. Uh, this is the, you know, Birmingham equestrian area. And we brand that. So then that, and as a result, people drive through and say, oh, that's really cool. So when you move into an area like that, you say, geez, you know, I'm living in this area. Maybe I don't want to do fireworks. Maybe I don't want to do this stuff because this, I'm in this zone. 
And then the developers turn around and say, okay, you know, people come in and say, now I want to live. I want to start a farm because I'm in that district. So it's, it's kind of funny. It's like you're creating districts, but you're not really formally creating a zoning district. You're just creating this kind of district where people feel from a community standpoint that they're living in a special place that's zoned that way, branded that way. Bob? Yes. Uh, you spoke about the redevelopment of opportunities on Highway 9. Yes. Um, do you expect as that transition occurs for uh, uh, there to be an increased demand for transferable development rights, TDRs? Well, there is a demand. There's a demand already. So the, the target shopping center development that you saw, um, it, it will require a great number of TDRs, a maximum buyout of TDRs. And um, it's kind of a funny thing because the developer looked at me and said, Bob, right now I'd have to go to about 15 different individuals and privately uh, negotiate those TDR purchases. It's just a whole lot of work. Oh, so other ideas with, which have been kicked around, Michelle will tell you is, you know, does the city set up a TDR bank kind of thing, you know, where we look at it? Uh, do we have larger landowners and they're coming in saying, Bob, we don't want to develop our property. And I'm saying, well, then why don't you TDR it? Uh, and it's, it's an option. And I've been dealing with that. It, it's just a lot of one-on-one -on -one with folks, but I think we're, we're, we're meeting headway on that, but there is a good demand for it. Well, the, the, the process that you, uh, you outlined there is sort of um, not very centralized and it sounds to me it, it's inefficient. And the notion of a TDR bank uh, might bring some focus to not only the process, but also provide an opportunity for us to uh, buy TDRs during low demand periods and sell right. them during higher demand periods to sort of facilitate um, the uh, process. Right, because a, a lot of the TDRs probably in a bank would trickle in slowly. You know, three here, five there, maybe we get some, we get lucky, we get a whole bunch. Uh, which we're working on, trying to get like bigger, bigger stuff to come in. But a lot of it would trickle in smaller and we'd be able to save and preserve a lot of those lots and, and, and give the people the relief and the money they need right away because it's market driven. And then we would store them. And then when you get a bigger development, yeah, they're going to want to buy them in bulk. It strikes me that this is something that we might want to add to our action list. Okay. Uh, so that's the, a good the idea. Bank. Okay. Let's add that in. That's a great idea. Super. Thank you. Just uh, one quick comment. One of the things that I hear on TDRs from people that own TDRs is that there's just not enough demand in the market because we grant the rights anyway. Um, so just something to put out on the table. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if we're granting the rights to add another story on a building or expand the square footage, and then maybe there's just not that much market for TDRs. So the, just so you know, the way the form-based code works, and we can expand on this later when I do the form-based code uh, update, um, the way it works is you have a base density and then you have a TDR density. And uh, there's a big delta between the two and most developers with the land price of today want the maximum density. So like when you looked at the um, self-storage, uh, Michelle's got a list of all of these that have come in, but the self-storage, that's actually a four-story building. It looks like a two-story building the way we designed it. So it's a low impact visually, but they went out and purchased TDRs to, to get that square footage that they wanted. And there's a whole bunch. Uh, I think the uh, Brickmont probably did it. Uh, they bought it. Uh, the, the, I can just, I'll give you a list of all the people so far. There is a demand uh, for it, especially with these new products coming in. Uh, the problem is that they don't want to go ahead and start doing it at a small scale. It's a tremendous amount of work for a developer to find 8, 10, 15 people to, to mass the TDR. Yeah, I think a bank would probably help it out. But it's something that you all can suggest and, and we can discuss. There's probably some cooperation that needs to take place. And for TDRs. part of the TDR program. We just need right. more communication, I think. So what, what happens really, I, I know we're running out of time, but I, I just want to tell everybody. So what happens is density, Robin will tell you, density you cannot get a variance from. So the only way to get additional density through the form-based code is with the purchase of a TDR. 
So you can't really go to Todd's group and say, we want to increase from three units per acre to six. Uh, if the code says you can do it, you can purchase it, but you can't get a variance on it. Uh, I have a uh, question or an, an idea around um, funding sources, just like you said. We've heard throughout tonight, passive parks, active parks, amphitheater, public art venues, trail systems, and we've done a lot of work, as it says, as it said earlier, in terms of putting those plans together. But funding is something that either has them move more slowly, or in the case of the green space bond, we were able to move rather quickly. <clears throat> as a work program, does it make sense for these categories of things, passive parks, active parks, amphitheater, performing arts, public art venues, and trail systems, to make a work program to explore additional bond opportunities? And that would be a situation where the citizens would vote on the pace and the tolerance for a bond for specific programs. Does that make sense as a, as a work program to move some of these things, these themes that we've heard tonight to action? Or oh, that would actually accelerate it. Because right now, I will tell you, we're not talking about Crab Apple, but if we were, we've been working with the developers in downtown Crab Apple to construct an amphitheater to include art display pods in the parks, to enhance all of that, to get the art world involved, to get the amphitheater, to get the performing arts to start coming into downtown uh, Crab Apple. We're not talking about Crab Apple, but, but that's all developer driven. If we want to do it at a larger scale uh, in other areas, I think it, that, that, would, that would be a great- Is that great something suggestion. that would help the city council in terms of understanding the, the citizens temperature for taking on that I, i'd like to just suggest even we can even more explore it with more surveys a, a, a survey that's more granular because we did you know having active and passive well those are two very different things so i would like to know have more detail on that before i mean because a bond is an expensive thing to do and that might be something worth a community education session too, so that the community understands the mechanics behind a bond and how that money is used. And it's not just a tax, for example. Um, the other thing that struck, struck me is um, from last meeting and then preparing for this one is, is there, as we think about some of these acquisition uh, features for the city, as well as some of the sustainability things, whether it's recycling or some of the green you know, initiatives with building, should we be also be considering a, a staff position for a grant administrator? Are we missing out on opportunities to get state or federal funding through grants? Because we don't even have anyone on staff who does that. That's, a, that's just a broad question for staff. Is that something that we should explore work, work program wise? Doesn't Michelle, Michelle's done some grants for us, I know, but, I know, but we can expand. Hoc, yeah, right? yeah. And we've got a lot of things that we want to perhaps move forward in the next That's 10 to 20 years. We did get, well, we did pretty good so far. We're doing pretty good, but so, not in a large scale. Yeah. So um, in the finance department, there's a need for a grants administrator because what has happened in the past, even though I might write a, write a grant and we win the grant, the administration didn't really happen. So there's been a number of occasions where we had to turn a grant down. So yes, we, we feel that we need a position like that to, to administer some of the grants so that as they come in, they can be funneled through and the projects can be implemented. Well, okay, and fair. And I was asking for this broader groups, you know, from what you've heard, but we can we can pick this topic up going forward. These will be some of the specific action items, work programs that this committee will recommend in in in, in terms of shaping not only how Milton would maybe look, but at what pace we might be able to achieve that. Okay.
No, and I think I'm completely in sync with what you're saying there. I was just trying to, I was building a case by saying, hey, we've got a lot of things that we'd like to do. Funding is going to be one of those issues, i.e. a bond. And perhaps these things are also qualify for grants. So that's that was my chain of thinking on that. Um, from a time standpoint, is there any additional input regarding some of the recommendations and topics that Bob talked on AG1? Okay. Thank you, Bob. We'll plan more time next time. For <laughs> <laughs> catering next time. Aren't yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, from a discussion questions, do we feel like we need to hit this or we kind of just done that on an ad hoc yeah, basis? Yeah, we definitely covered that sort of in our own way. Um, there is a, another public comment period. I didn't know if there was anyone online. Um, actually, we have next steps. I think to hit before we hit the public comment. Okay, um, this is a summary of some of our next steps. Um, we will be talking, we have an uh, internal steering committee tomorrow. We'll be talking about um, everything that was discussed in this meeting tonight, creating a meeting summary um, and some conclusions for you guys to, to ponder. Um, we're going to be collecting feedback. We'll be you know, keeping our eye out on, on Facebook and uh, continuing to promote the ideas wall um, throughout the process, and we'll be preparing items for our community education sessions, which I will tell you about in the next slide. Um, in terms of the CPAC, um, just keep your eyes out for um, emails about upcoming meetings. There is a potential work session on February 25th, and that will be confirmed um, in the next few days, I believe. Um, and there is an established scheduled meeting on the 11th of March as well. So just stay tuned for more information about that. And of course, continuing to talk to your neighbors and your friends about this process and to get as many voices involved. But um, I do think it's worthwhile to pencil in February 25th and March 11th as, as um, sessions. And uh, here are saved dates for the community education sessions. These will be on Zoom. The first one is gonna be talking about placemaking and economics. And a huge component of that will be branding. Um, we will have um, people from TSW and from uh, David and his team talking about these topics, um, as well as some other speakers. We're still developing and defining that outline. We'll be discussing that tomorrow with the steering committee um, and um, getting those finite topics down. Um, and that will be February 11th at 6 p.m. on Zoom and Facebook Live. Uh, on February 18th, which is the following Thursday, we will be doing a session talking about uh, future thinking in Milton. Uh, this wraps topics together, including sustainability, uh, smart cities technologies, and transportation. Uh, and again, that will be on Zoom and streaming on Facebook Live um, and more details to come about those. But this, just for clarification, we absolutely would love for this committee and, the, and these members, your, our members, to join these sessions. Yes. Um, this is another data point of hearing from the community. Um, and so it should be less intrusive since it'll be on Zoom. You can do it from home, on the road, whatever. Right, and we, we'll have the presentations recorded and available um, as well. And we will have a you know interactive component with the community for people to speak um, throughout these presentations as well to get some more voices involved. And that's all we have for you tonight. I uh, appreciate your time and your, all of your efforts uh, for this meeting. Okay. Um, is it before, uh, be, I, we're now scheduled to go into public comment. Do we have any public comment on a Zoom or Facebook or whatever? None. And is there any here in person? Okay. Um, well, great, then if there's no additional last minute comments from Bob, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd uh, make a motion that we adjourn. Do I have a second? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. 
We are adjourned. Thank you.